with respect to this idea of autonomous vehicles. Um, I, I will actually use autonomous vehicles or AVs today, and I'll actually give an indication why I think driverless cars is a little bit too limited um, of, a, of a perspective with respect to the potentials of this technology and its implications. Uh, so uh, this is a, taken from the geography of urban transportation. Uh, it's a lecture I actually use, a, a notes I use in a, a class I teach here in the spring. Um, this is a book called, uh, uh, it's a, a chapter by a gentleman named Euler, and he basically says there's four eras of transportation revolution since the 1890s, and they've, everyone has not done nothing more than change the form and expand the metropolitan areas. And so, you know, we have the walking era, the streetcar era, the recreational auto era, and the freeway era up to about today. And the question is, well, are we entering a new era? Clearly, we weren't recognizing the streetcar era perhaps until it was past. Um, maybe we're in the, uh, the AV era. Um, and what will that do to the patterns of growth? I think there's actually some reasonable evidence that this will, um, um, uh, conjecture that this will continue just to expand the metropolitan area that we live in today. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about this idea of peak travel, um, or at least in my circles, I don't know where circle you come from, uh, but you know, this idea that, oh, we finally reached our peak because the millennials don't want to drive, and they're all moving back to the cities and so forth, but, but you know, the question is, is every blip here is some crisis or another, oil crises or so forth, and we had the Great Recession, and actually the evidence now suggests we're coming out of that Great Recession, and we're kind of going right back, hewing back to that forecast. Might AVs change this? Um, it's not... Um, quite clear. I'm a planner, so I can be critical of planners, I hope. Um, we've done pretty poorly with respect to the giant trends in transportation over time. We were grateful to get rid of the, the, the horse um, as, a, as a mode of transport. Um, and we were so great to get grateful to have the horseless carriage. And the planning of the horseless carriage was taken over by the engineers, no offense. But this is, you know, what we got. We got, we thought this was going to save the cities by building highways into the cities, and many of those cities thus um, have not yet recovered. Um, and actually, even more so, I would argue, with respect to parking. Um, we, par we plan for the maximum with respect to parking, and that's what we get. Um, and so, well, what might ABs do to us? Well, I wanted to actually say that because we're in the neighborhood, of course, um, this is what um, the, the, those same uh, great transport planners had envisioned for a Central Square. And I think some people in the audience actually helped stop this in circa 1970. Um, and, you know, this is what we have to say. Uh, right? Uh, this is Kendall Square, 1980, and this is Kendall Square today. Uh, almost inarguably not among, well, I guess I can't say this if there's anyone from Boston in the neighborhood, but the most uh, the primest commercial real estate innovation real estate in the United States. Um, uh, the South Boston one, um, uh, not the state. Uh, and all of this, in fact, now I'm borrowing the next slides from the city of Cambridge, so I hope I'm not abusing them. All of this is actually without, you know, we have almost uh, 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 370,000 square meters of additional office construction with basically no new traffic. So this, in my view, is what we should be aiming to achieve um, with respect to any technology uh, and transportation in our innovation economy. Um, now, what do autonomous vehicles bring? <laughs> uh, you know, it's a combination of analog, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine she would actually be looking at magazines, probably be spreading on her phone. But, you know, this is, autonomous vehicles are not new. Around the same time that uh, um, the idea of congestion pricing, Vicky was actually first identifying this as a technological innovation where it was going to be via computers. At the same time, uh, the family was going to be putting back in the car on um, a road trip. Um, uh, now, this translates into economic speak as the value of time will go down. Meaning we should be willing to bear longer travel times and be willing to bear more congestion. Because we don't care. We can, you know, we can do all those other things we do when we're sitting around anyway. Watching videos, playing with our email, doing things on Snapchat and these other devices, the apps that I don't even understand. Um, but, uh, this also actually really changes the equation for the idea of congestion pricing. Because congestion pricing, recovering that social marginal cost of travel, that also goes down. So it, in fact, makes the argument for congestion pricing weaker, um, which I think is important. Um, I also think it's important that we remember that autonomous, as I said at the beginning, is not just cars. Um, this is the Volvo electric bus, not autonomous bus. But the thing that this is already showing is you can bring vehicles into real estate. This is a bus stop at a cafe, indoors. Um, and this is the driver who I had the luck to interview afterward. And he was like, 
oh, it's just like driving a Tesla. And I was saying, this was literally a week after Tesla came out with the self-driving app, and I said, well, I hope not. Um, I can say that to him, but that's what I was thinking. Because of course, autonomous public transport can bring great benefits for the users, for the finances and economics of it, for the operations, because bus launching can be controlled and so forth. But of course, it's a disruptive, disruptive technology with respect to the current business. Um, and also, I think, of course, the last mile at least, I mean, I feel like autonomous freight has a clear role to play on those cross-country journeys and highways. But when it comes to the cities as well, I, I don't know how many of you have seen the new uh, Amazon vans, right? Um, this is definitely step one to Amazon. You know, they're gonna fly drones to your house, but they're gonna drive these to your house without the drive. Um, soon. Uh, right, uh, 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 speaking um, uh, conservatively. Now, there was a very interesting study a few, uh, last year that was done by a colleague at the University of Pennsylvania where he actually went out and surveyed the top 25 um, NPOs, Metropolitan Planning Organizations in the United States, to see first whether their regional transportation plans actually had autonomy in them or driving these people's in them. He found none, one of them actually had it mentioned. And then he went out and interviewed some of the planners involved and came to some suggestions of why is it not mentioned. I think it's important to just point to one. One is we're so uncertain about what it can do is we can't really deal with it within the current codified planning process. I think mean, this is really important. Um, and then the second is, well, it's, we know it's important, but we don't really know what it might mean for investment, and we're here to decide what it might mean. And so autonomous vehicles, let's kind of at least forget about them for the current planning process. I think that will change during the next wave of, of, of plans, and I think that's really, I think, a nice point of the dialogue for today. Um, I won't belabor this because I want to get on, but essentially um, three NPOs did uh, have tried to model this and all of them except for the base case, like one example from, from Seattle is that this is going to grow VMT anywhere from 5 to 35% growth in VMT for a range of mechanisms such as reduced value of time and so forth. Um, and, and the need for, or the ability to squeeze more vehicles into space because you have more, uh, 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 you have less need to margin for error in driver um, misbehavior. Um, and so I think some of the things I'd like to think about today, um, again, this idea of what does this do to value of time, um, what this does for our ability to design infrastructure in the future, um, uh, the ability, what, what this might mean for blurring that interface between buildings and public space. Vehicles coming into, you know, drop freight off into shopping malls, for example. Uh, the public transport implications, the freight last mile, as I said. Um, for infrastructure, especially parking, but for other roadway infrastructure, we much more need to account for the uncertainty. And that that's actually should be viewed as an asset, an asset that we can build with anticipated more flexibility into um, the fact that we don't know what the demand will bring. Um, and finally, you know, I think it's worth mentioning that AVs are, are just one manifestation of this whole innovative economy that the Boston region is trying to maintain and foment. Uh, just speaking from MIT, we have two spin-offs within the last six months. Uh, one uh, in Singapore and here in Cambridge that already has about 40 employees, another one off of this ride around Chin spun off. Um, so we're in this realm, um, but I think that we require uh, um, you know, places like Kendall Square to make this round really, um, truly grow. And I think that if we want to consider what autonomous vehicles are, we definitely should not be looking at the future with rosy, rose colored glasses, because I think that's been problematic. Um, we need to truck start thinking about the formalized planning process and take advantage of uncertainty, because we actually don't know what the forecast should be. So I would say, rather than say, uncertainty cripples us from making decisions, uncertainty should make us be innovative in the types of decisions that we make. Tony, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see so many people here today. It's a pleasure to have our panelists. It's a pleasure for me, always, to be back at MIT. It is true, I napped considerably. Um, but I haven't for a long time. Uh, and I'm not planning to today, because we have a wonderful panel on a fascinating topic. Uh, you heard Tony at the end of his presentation list a long litany of things we work on at MAPC. That is one of our, it's one of the great benefits of the agency. It keeps the work very interesting. It's also one of our challenges that for an organization that explicitly works on how things interact with one, and out, with one another in our very complex and diverse region, we have to balance those different interests all the time. And we have to always ask the questions that most people in silos aren't asking. 
which is how does water policy affect housing policy, how does that affect economic development and jobs, how does that affect transportation and mobility, and those are honestly the interesting questions, the most interesting questions, and the ones that I think are very germane to this question of autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles. I think Lauren will probably tell us which one is actually the right term to use. I'm not sure if they are completely interchangeable or not. Uh, so what we are doing today is something that NAPC really likes to do a lot of, which is to try and find out something that might happen in the future and say that we should learn about it and start planning for it today. We should deal with its implications. We should recognize that every major change has its pluses and its minuses, but we actually have it within our ability to make sure that the pluses exceed the minuses, or to make sure perhaps when that transportation mode arrives, it is a little different or differently deployed than might otherwise be the case in the initial phases of moving toward it at this point in time. And so I'm pleased to see that so many of you have joined us I know that you come from many different disciplines. The vast majority of you, perhaps every single one of you, will be spending most of your time on other things over the next decade or two. But every year that passes, the work you do is going to be more influenced by this technology, by its success or by its failure, by its difficulties or its benefits by the way government chooses to respond to it from a regulatory perspective, or even by the way government chooses not to respond to it from a regulatory perspective. As time passes, all of that will have more influence on the work that you do, the priorities you strike, the successes you have, and the challenges you face. So I am very pleased not only to have begun the day with the excellent remarks from Chris and Tony, which I think really set a framework for us, but also to begin to, uh, to initiate the panel of experts that are going to talk to you from their different perspectives about this technology, and then hopefully we will have a good period of time for comments and questions, particularly questions from the audience. You have already received, I believe, is this true? You've already received bios for all the all the uh, participants, so I'm not going to go over them in a tremendous amount of detail, but I am now going to just very briefly mention who the four panelists are. Uh, we have Jonathan Koopman, who is a senior engineer in technology, innovation, and policy at the US DOT Volpe Center. All of us in the transportation field are, of course, terribly familiar with Volpe and the tremendous amount of work that they do uh, to try and study the transportation system to teach us about the ins and outs of mobility and to help us make more informed decisions from day to day. So we're very pleased to have Jonathan with us today. Uh, we are also very pleased to have Lauren Isaac visiting us all the way from the Bay Area. Uh, I first heard Lauren speak at an event which she no doubt does no, no longer remembers in Raleigh, North Carolina by our National Association of Regional Councils, which is our trade association, NARC, which I often refer to as the organization most in need of a name change. But um, we, uh, I heard Lauren speak there. Uh, I and the entire audience were enthralled by her remarks and learned such a tremendous amount about this new technology and its implications, uh, not without criticism, but its implications. And uh, I immediately decided that we needed to bring Lauren here, and it's taken a little while, but not actually all that long. And we're very pleased to have um, her here with us today. She works, as best I can tell, at two completely separate jobs, uh, one of which is at WSP Parsons Breaker Hawk, where she is the manager of sustainable transportation. I think not just for the Bay Area, but for the entire country. Is that correct? For the entire country. And at the same time, somehow, she's project manager for our colleagues, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC, for their rideshare program in the Bay Area. So we're very lucky to have Lauren here. We are also very lucky to have joining us shortly. When I popped outside, he was just calling me on the phone. He's been a little bit delayed. One of our great leaders in the greater Boston region, Mayor Joe Pertitone from the city of Somerville, who not only is very personally interested and engaged, in new technology and how it affects the city of Somerville, 
And obviously, increasingly, Somerville is a community where a lot of new technology is being produced and managed. Uh, but he is also a great leader of regionalism in the greater Boston area. He is a member of our executive committee at MADC. He is also a member of the, the chair of the Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition. And through a representative, Tom Bent, uh, the city of Somerville is also represented on the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. So, uh, we are very pleased to have all three of these individuals joining us today. And I would ask the panelists, which I guess are at the moment just Jonathan and, and Lauren, to come join me up here. And uh, Jonathan is going to kick things off. While they come up, I'm going to say a few thank yous. Uh, my biggest, biggest thank you is for a member of my staff who did the lion's share of the work, the thinking and the organizing, uh, for today's event. And in fact, is leading our work at MAPC in the field of autonomous vehicles. She wrote a chapter of that white paper along with her colleague, Pat Roach, uh, which Tony talked about that will be coming out later in the year. And that is a senior regional planner at MAPC in our transportation department, Allison Felix. Thank you very much. The number of people on our staff who supported Allison and contributed to today's two events uh, are two great to mention, but I wanted to mention two people who were particularly active. Austin Dawson on some of the administrative work supporting today's event and preparing for today's event and making sure all of you knew about it and could be here. And then also from our communications department, Karen Adelman, who is here with us today. Thank you, Austin and Karen. And lastly, on the MIT side, in addition to obviously uh, thanking Chris and Kent, who will be here. Uh, I think not. Is he here now? Kent Austin, or he will be here soon. Uh, in addition to the two of them from MIT, I want to thank Ezra Glenn, who teaches at my alma mater, the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, affectionately known to those of us who've been there simply as Course 11. Uh, Ezra has been a planner in several communities. Uh, in the region, outside the region. I am most familiar with his work in the city of Lowell and also, I believe, the town of Watertown. And um, Ezra has really helped us here to make this event a reality, and so I want to thank him. I also just want to mention a few of my uh, former professors and colleagues from the Urban Studies Department who I am just very pleased to have here. And they are Joe Ferreira from Urban Studies and Planning, uh, Ralph Gackenheimer from Urban Studies and Planning, and also a former constituent of mine when I was in the House. And I am particularly happy to have the former Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning, John DeMoncho, who has joined us as well. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. <laughs> How many times can I say lastly and make it untrue? I do feel it's necessary to uh, introduce and thank for his presence and his leadership the current president of MAPC, the town manager from the town of Littleton, Keith Bergman. Thank you. And now, I think I was wrong. I think Jonathan is not speaking for us, but we are going to let our guests from out of town. Um, as Chris said, my name is Tony Bitzik. I work with an organization called Frontier Group. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, public interest think tank whose mission is to provide information and ideas to help Americans build a cleaner, healthier, fairer, and more democratic country. Um, and we've been really blessed with the good fortune to have the chance to work with Transportation for Massachusetts and its efforts to help to make sense of some of the implications of innovative mobility technologies in the Commonwealth uh, and to develop a uh, appropriate forward-looking policy approach uh, to incorporating these technologies into our transportation system in ways that maximize societal benefits. And, um, you know, I think all of us are here this morning in part because we see this moment as a time of both profound excitement and profound uncertainty in the future of mobility technologies and what their implications are for our communities, our economy, and our way of life. Um, but I think it's important as a way of setting the stage for the conversations that will follow regarding technology and its possible courses over the next several decades um, to remind ourselves of the role of transportation in our commonwealth and in our economy, which is to say that transportation when we travel, we don't usually, with the exception perhaps of taking a nice ride in a convertible with the top down on a sunny day on a beautiful road, generally speaking, we don't travel as people just to travel. We travel and we invest in the transportation system 
to make ourselves happier, more prosperous, and lead more fulfilling lives than we otherwise would be able to do. And while our current transportation system helps us to be able to do that in many ways, uh, it also falls short of that potential in a number of other ways. And I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes walking through some of the ways in which our system falls short of its potential. Keeping going? Okay, great. So, the first is through death and injuries on our roads. In 2012, 349 people in Massachusetts lost their lives in motor vehicle crashes. That is about four-fifths the size of the graduating class at the high school of my two sons of ten. If we lost four-fifths of the graduating class of high schoolers in a plane crash or a train crash, it would be international news. But because it happens every day on our roads, we accept it, maybe not willingly, but, but often without a great deal of notice, as the price of mobility. In addition, more than 4,000 people are seriously injured in motor, motor vehicle crashes in Massachusetts every year. And I bet that if we were to take a poll of this room, there would be very few of us here who have not either been personally affected in a lasting way by a motor vehicle crash, or who knew someone who was personally affected in a lasting way by a crash. And those crashes have economic implications as well, uh, with an estimated $5.8 billion in economic losses due to motor vehicle crashes in Massachusetts in 2010, according to the National Highways Travis, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And those are losses that come from lost productivity, from uncompensated, from uninsured health care costs, from property damage, and many other sources. And crashes aren't the only way in which our transportation system damages our health. Uh, approximately 1,300 people in Massachusetts die prematurely every year from exposure to particular pollution from transportation. Even more find their quality of life diminished, or are harmed in other ways by exposure to other pollutants. And those deaths and injuries and economic losses often come at the expense of a system that doesn't always serve us very well. Uh, the average rush hour commuter in greater Boston who is driving can expect to spend about 64 hours a year stuck in rush hour traffic. That's about two and a half days that people could be spending with their loved ones, engaging in recreational activities, or in having for the productivity of the economy. And while our transit system is a key cog of our regional economy, it's also the case that this, even in this mo one of the most transit-oriented metropolitan areas in the country, here in Greater Boston, the vast majority of jobs are essentially inaccessible to the typical person in the region who is traveling via transit. And so as a result of that, in order to pursue economically viable lives, most of us need to own a car. And that gets rather expensive. Here in Massachusetts, or in, actually in Greater Boston, about one out of every seven dollars that we spend is spent on transportation, which is second only to housing. And if you're poor, that number is even higher. Nationally, about one quarter of household income for low-income households goes toward transportation. And the challenges get greater as we look forward. Uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act here in Massachusetts calls for us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from our entire economy by 80%. That's roughly consistent with what is believed to be necessary to meet the targets of the two degrees Celsius target in the recently approved Paris Climate Agreement. And that is something that is going to require either a wholesale repowering of our transportation system or a transition to a, a much transformed way of moving people and goods through and around the Commonwealth, or a combination of both. And lastly, all of that is going to be taking place in an uh, atmosphere of continued population growth. Um, the report last week by a better city using data from MAPC estimated that between 2010 and 2030, the population of the urban core of Greater Boston will be expected to increase by 17.5%. So I think what brings us here is a sense that innovative mobility technologies create an opportunity for us, not only to improve the convenience and comfort of people who travel, but also to address some long-standing problems that had often seemed intractable. And so as planners, as policymakers, as technologists, as citizens, our task is to figure out how to harness that opportunity and not to let it pass us by. 
So last year, Transportation for Massachusetts, which is the statewide coalition of groups that advocates on transportation issues in the Commonwealth, um, launched the Innovative Mobility Project to bring this conversation about new mobility technologies and services into the communities that those services and technologies will ultimately help to reshape. And the goals of the project are, first of all, to summarize for the public and decision makers the current status of innovative mobility technologies in Massachusetts. What's here? What is likely to be here three, five, ten years down the road? The second purpose is to identify the opportunities and challenges that those technologies and services create for us to address long-standing transportation problems. The third is to develop an in a, a public policy framework to guide innovative mobility, recognizing that both intelligent public policy action will be critical for maximizing the societal benefits of innovative mobility, but also recognizing that poorly thought out government action can in fact hamper the very innovation that we hope to unleash. And lastly, to identify potential new mobility pilot projects in our communities. The focus of this work has been in the development of an innovative mobility white paper, which will be published in the fall of this year. And the process of producing that white paper has brought together people from a wide variety of disparate organizations, from environmental and public interest NGOs, to um, folks who work primarily with the business community, to planning organizations such as NAPC. And that collaboration, I think, has really served both as a collective learning opportunity that's been invaluable, I think, to folks who are working with communities and helping them understand and improve transportation, uh, but it also brings a rather unique perspective and, and flavor to the conversation, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And the white paper has been informed by interviews with innovative mobility practitioners, including probably a couple of people in this room, um, four roundtables that have involved an array of spec, uh, stakeholder groups from business groups to uh, community organizations to academics uh, to other experts, including one roundtable was focused specifically on conversations with community-based organizations representing low-income communities and communities of color in Boston, which are groups that tend not to have their voices be often very well heard in these conversations. Uh, the white paper is also informed by a survey of T for Mass members and by a review of relevant literature. And you'll notice that I've been talking about innovative mobility as opposed to driverless cars or autonomous vehicles here. And that's for a reason, uh, which is that it's important to recognize that even as we are making tremendous strides toward autonomous vehicles in the lab and increasingly on the streets, that there are a number of other changes that are happening in transportation that are both important in their own right and that have the capability to shape how the autonomous vehicle revolution plays out over the next couple of decades. So among those new tools and technologies are information technology that supports sustainable modes of travel, um, folks who use uh, multimodal trip planners or mobile payment or other ways of using information technology to better interact with the transportation system. Shared mobility services such as car sharing, bike sharing, Lyft, Uber, microtransit, um, as well as other changes that are happening that aren't necessarily covered in our white paper that are happening outside of this you know, sort of innovative mobility tech-driven world that are also very important. Uh, one of them is the continued reduction in price and improvement in performance in electric vehicles. So we talked a little bit about, uh, about the Tesla breakthrough uh, with public acceptance of electric vehicles, um, the sense that um, we are potentially going to be moving to a new fuel and vehicle realm in transportation within the next couple of decades, um, as well as changes that are happening outside of technology entirely. Things like the reconcentration and resurgence of our urban core, certainly relevant here in Boston and in Kendall Square in Cambridge, uh, as well as uh, increases in the use of low-tech transportation, bicycling, walking, and the like. Um, and then finally, sort of the broader economic changes that are sweeping through our communities and the economy at large. So while we talk about autonomous vehicles as being an important technological change, and it is, we also have to recognize that the context in which that change is happening is also going to be evolving over the next couple of decades. And we need to be cognizant of those changes. 
And so in the Innovative Mobility White Paper, we've been looking at an array of potential impacts of innovative mobility services and technologies. And importantly, we've been trying to expand this conversation out from the urban core, which is usually what we think of, certainly what we think of when we think of Lyft and Uber and microtransit services. So much of that is happening and been pioneered in places like Boston and Cambridge. We've been trying to expand the conversation to think about what are the implications and possible applications of some of these technologies in places that aren't explicitly urban, in the suburbs, in the exurbs, in rural Massachusetts. And I think that's an important perspective to bring to the conversation that we're going to have today, which is if we're going to truly take advantage of the transformative potential of these solutions, we need to be thinking about how they affect everyone. And so when it comes to autonomous vehicle impacts, um, you know, one of the things that we have looked at in the white paper uh, has been much of the discussion, and I'm sure that the panel will be talking about this very soon, about the different implications of different deployment trajectories and different modes of deployment of autonomous cars. And it's I, and just, just try to set the stage a little bit for, for the discussion. Um, the implications can be quite different depending on the model of deployment, so whether we use autonomous vehicle technology to reinforce the current system of individual vehicle ownership that we have today, or whether it is part of a broader transition to shared networks of vehicles. That has important implications. And it also has important implications how we integrate autonomous vehicles into the transportation system more broadly. Um, as Chris had mentioned, when we experienced the transformative uh, the disruptive technology of the car in the early 20th century, uh, we made a series of decisions about how we were going to integrate the car into our lives. So we knocked down a bunch of buildings in our urban areas, we built a bunch of highways, we built a bunch of parking garages, uh, we let our transit systems decay, we shunted people who walked and bike over the margins, uh, and all of that had implications, and none of it was necessarily inevitable. So how we integrate these solutions into the transportation system will be very important. And public policy plays a critical role in that. Um, and it may, in some areas, play a decisive role. And lastly, it's important to recognize that, uh, as uh, you know, I think Chris had mentioned or talked about with me earlier, that the transition from the system we have now to the place where we're going could be quite a long one. And so we have to be thinking about what happens in the transition period. How do we manage the transition from one mobility paradigm to another in a way that protects everyone's interests. And so I think we can look forward to a great panel this morning, and I'm so glad and thankful for you all to be here. And to moderate that panel will be Mark Drayson. Um, as Chris said, my name is Tony Bitzik. I work Hi, good morning, everyone. Good Thank morning. you so much for having me. Um, yep, I'm there. Um, that was the nicest introduction. So, um, so about two years ago, um, I started reading about driverless cars, and by the way, I do use the term autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, driverless cars, interchangeably, and that can be debated, I'm happy to debate it. Um, and I started reading about them, and what I found is that there's this huge, there was, especially back two years ago, a huge race with the technology. Which car company is going to come out with something faster? Is Google in the lead, or is it going to be, um, you know, Honda? Who knows? So. Um, what I realized, kept looking at it from the lens of the government, since as uh, an employee of WSP Parks and Springbok, that's what a lot of, especially my work has been, it's helping government agencies, I thought, there's almost nothing out there about what the government can do. And so I started reading all the news from that lens, and, and that led to me applying for an internal fellowship program and spending the last two years essentially researching and developing a guide for how government can plan for driverless cars. So, um, I'll, I'd love to start with this graph. I don't know if any of you actually saw the magazine, but I think it's just so relevant. Um, I find that people are shocked when they hear soon they're coming, and I am going to talk about that. Um, so, I talk really fast. I'm from New York, so, but I feel like I'm a good company. So, um, but I'm going to get through all these things. Um, Drivers people's one of the things that's important to just establish a baseline of knowledge around these. I'll zip through that, talk about what's going to happen to our society. We've already heard some of that mentioned. Um, I'll outline what I see as two kind of futuristic views of what our society could look like, um, and finally talk about next steps. So um, starting with Driverless Vehicles 101. So um, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, came out with a definition. And this, was, this was a while ago, but um, I think it's really important. The key part of this is that 
Um, the driver will provide destination or navigation input, but that the driver is not expected to be available for control at any time during the trip. So that picture of that person sleeping before, that's exactly what is appropriate for a driverless vehicle. It's, the car does not expect you to take over at any time. So um, NHTSA also came up with five levels of automation. Um, my research has been entirely focused on fully automated or level four automation. Level zero, looking at the top of the chart, that's really referring to absolutely no automation. Think about when cars first came out, you needed a driver to push on the, ba the brakes when they wanted the car to stop, push on the gas when they want the car to go, and turn the wheel when they want to turn it. That's zero, it's no automation. Over the years, we've had incremental bits of automation introduced. So think about cruise control, what we're seeing now with self-parking, um, what Tesla is doing. Those are still partial automation, because even in the Tesla, we, are, we as humans, we are expected to take over control of the car. We are liable if that car gets into an accident or anything. So um, I'm focused on level four. So when I talk about driverless cars, I talk about the kind of vehicle that literally you can be sleeping. Or in my dream scenario, I can be working out. I have an electrical trainer in the car. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so in terms of the timeline, I love showing this graphic. So this, what this graphic shows is that autonomous vehicles will be publicly available in the 2018 to 2020 timeframe. Um, that is something that pretty much every major automaker and technology developer has said that they will do. Um, I will just say in the news, they often mix up partial automation and full automation, so I don't think every single automaker will necessarily make that timeline, but um, this, as this graphic shows, that, that is likely what will happen. This graphic also shows, and I don't know if you can read that tiny font, but as of 2026, we'll have 100% autonomous penetration, or what they call utopian society. So this is, saying, this is saying that in 10 years, we'll have full driverless society. And I think that that is super aggressive. Um, this, there are probably 50 graphics like this that have forecasts of when driverless vehicles are coming. The reason I like this one is because it is so aggressive and it just gives a perspective. Um, I would say my opinion, based on having looked at a lot of these, is that they generally agree upon around 30 to 40 percent penetration of driverless vehicles in our society in the 2030 time frame. So when you think that the average age of a vehicle is about 11 years old, and you know you'll have some early adopters that will just dump their car the minute a driverless vehicle is available, I think that what's likely to happen is this slow, gradual introduction of driverless vehicles into our society. So. Um, you know, as I said, the news is very focused on the technology development, but there are quite a few other things that need to come into place before driverless vehicles can actually be introduced into society. Um, I'll start with human factors. I'll, I'll ask all of you, how many of you, if there was a driverless vehicle outside on the street right now, how many of you would get into it? That's pretty good. Um, that's great. So I, I love to point this out that in different geographies around the country, so I, I've given some version of this talk around the country. Um, I gave this talk in Connecticut about six months ago, and I had one person in a room of 200. Yeah. Um, and I'm from Connecticut, so I, <laughs> um, being in the Bay Area, it's, it's usually like 90% of the room that's willing to get into a driverless vehicle. This is a very, um, very aggressive audience. I like it that you can get in one too. But the human factors one is really huge. Um, people are not necessarily ready for driverless vehicles. And I, I do think that having them introduced into society and making them less of a science fiction will help. Um, but other examples, and I'm just going to talk about a few of these, the privacy and security concerns are substantial. Um, the privacy issue, who's going to own the travel data? Do you want Google knowing where you're going at all times? Um, that, that is a really big question. And the other one is security. Um, can terrorists get hold of my vehicle and then drive it into a building or something like that? It's scary, and these are issues that the federal government is tackling. Um, and, and another big one is insurance. Who's liable? So if a driverless vehicle hits another driverless vehicle, um, who is, who's responsible for that? Is it the driver? There really is no driver. Um, the technology developer, the hardware manufacturer. Um, and then if a driverless vehicle hits a manual car, it becomes that much more complicated. So these are the kinds of things that we have to figure out. Um, so in terms of impacts, um, there are huge, huge positive impacts. And we've already heard some of this. Um, currently, about 90% of the accidents on our roadways are due to human error. So, think speeding, distracted driving, drunk driving. If we eliminate humans, 
we have the potential to eliminate 90% of, of the accidents on our roadways. So that's, that's by far one of the biggest impact, positive impacts. The other big one is improved mobility for elderly, youth, and disabled. Um, there is a fabulous video that Google put out of a um, blind person sitting in the Google car and just being so happy as the vehicle you know, drives along. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the other positives in a minute. On the negative side, and you already heard this risk of increased vehicle miles traveled or BMT. Again, I'll get into that. Insurance policy disruption, some would argue that it's not a bad thing, but, um, but it is really calling into question how standard insurance is, is handled. Um, increased urban sprawl. Um, the whole value of time thing that we heard about, there is significant concern that people are going to be willing to live much farther from where they work. Um, and if that happens, we could have, you know, go from having less dense, more dense cities to less dense cities. Um, and what does that mean for every aspect of city planning? Um, and finally, job loss. As with any disruptive technology or disruption, um, there's going to be a big impact on jobs. Um, think about all the driving professions, but also the industries that have been created around the driving professions. Um, that being said, I think it's important to note that driverless vehicles, as with any disruption, will also create a lot of new jobs. It's just going to be a transition as we go from that um, certain sectors of job loss to certain sectors of job gain. So I like to just highlight some of the other industries impacted because driverless vehicles are going to be disruptive across our entire society. It's not just the trucking industry, the drivers that are going to be impacted. So um, I'm going to highlight a handful. Um, it's really actually fun to brainstorm others, but um, car park suppliers, you know, driverless, driverless vehicles and just in general vehicles, um, while the hardware may stay the same, the design of the cars is likely going to change. But also, there's going to be a lot more technology involved, like biometric entry instead of keys to get in. And the bumpers are probably going to be very sensors driven so that you don't have accidents. Um, so car part suppliers are going to be greatly impacted with the, what the car parts are. Um, advertising. You know, um, advertising companies, there's going to be a ton of data available about where we're going and when. So advertising companies will actually have a plethora of new data to use to get very targeted advertising for us. Um, car repair shops, you know, there will still need to be repairs, but the skills needed to address the car and the new technologies will change. Car dealerships, that question of if ownership of cars will continue at the same level, if there's um, more of a shared use society, it is possible that the car dealerships are going to see a big um, decline in sales. Brick and mortar stores, I think it's really interesting to think about even now how our lifestyle is changing with how we do shopping. But with driverless vehicles, you have the ability to send your vehicle out or send a vehicle out, pick up your goods, and bring it back for you. So the actual design of brick and mortar stores might be more geared towards pick up and drop off. Um, another interesting model is that the cost of transporting people is going to go down so much. It's possible that cars, that stores, think for example like Kmart or Walmart, could actually pay to pick, drive, pick shoppers up and bring them to their store. So it's really going to be thinking, rethinking the whole business model of stores. Um, a couple came up at the same time. Driving professions, that one's pretty straightforward, but everything from taxis, which were already really seen disrupted, um, but the trucking industry is a huge one. I've seen stats that something like 10% of the jobs in the United States revolve around the, the trucking industry, so not just driving, but everything around it. Um, hotels, when you think that um, the times you, I don't know how often you drive across the country, but you travel somewhere, you maybe don't need to stop in a hotel overnight because you can just go to sleep in your car while it's still traveling. Um, so the hotel industry could be greatly impacted. <laughs> Um, insurance, I already talked about that, and data analysis. Um, it's, it's not going to be just in terms of protecting people's data, but also the ability, the skill set that comes with data mining and data analysis. There is going to be so much more data available, we're already seeing it today, but those professions are going to have that much more importance. Um, and healthcare. So I actually did this talk a couple of weeks ago, and someone raised their hand and said, um, what about organ transplants? Aren't we going to have a lot less organs available? With people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, there, so the ripple effect is actually huge. So, um, okay. So, our driverless future. So, if you can all kind of travel with me in the future, think forward like 50, 60 years, and we do have a fully driverless society, I'm going to lay out a couple of different scenarios with this lovely background. 
picture. So, um, so the first scenario I'm going to lay out for you, um, I call it the utopian scenario. Uh, sorry, wait, no, I'm going to do the nightmare first. Um, so, <laughs> um, imagine a world where, so imagine I live in the suburbs, any, pick any city, I live in the suburbs, I'm a mom, um, I get my kids ready for school, and then I summon my private car, driverless car, to come pick my kids up and bring them to school. So the car comes, picks up the kids, and takes them to school. During that time, I finish getting ready, and then I summon that car to come back, pick me up, and then take me to work. So I get in the car, and there's likely a lot of traffic, but I don't care because I have a coffee maker in there, I have a big screen TV with the news going, um, I have my elliptical trainer, of course, um, and, and I, I you know, do my workout, get my job started for the day, and it's just this wonderful, wonderful time. And it might take me maybe even double as long to get into work, but I don't really care because I have this amazing you know, um, backseat <laughs> that I'm able to hang out and have a productive day, so, or productive morning. So I get into my office, um, and then I send the car out to pick up some Dillman's Marins for me. So first I have it go to three different grocery stores because I want to get the cheapest toilet paper, the cheapest produce, and then the cheapest, um, um, <laughs> so the car kind of does all these errands, and then it goes to a remote parking lot about 15 miles outside of the city and waits for its next assignment. So um, I would say I've had quite a few people say that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> What's so bad about that? But as a room full of what seems to be a lot of planners, I think you can appreciate that that has huge risk for adding a lot of extra vehicle miles traveled. So not only are you adding a lot of additional unlinked trips with unnecessary um, trips, but also you're doing it when there's no driver even in the car. So this is this is multiplying by many folds, many times. So so that's the nightmare scenario. We play out the exact same scenario, what I call the utopian scenario. Um, so I wake up in the morning, get my kids ready for school, and then the driverless school bus comes and picks up my kids. <laughs> driverless school bus then drops them off, and I go. I get ready. Once I'm ready, I use my smartphone and I summon a ride, and a little pod car comes, picks me up, picks up a couple of my neighbors, and brings me to the local train station. Um, it is perfectly timed, so I get there and I immediately get on my train. I never take out my wallet because my phone is able to do the whole thing seamlessly. And then when I'm on the train, I have a lovely commute in, I get some work done, um, finish up, get a nap, get into my office, and then I also realize I need some groceries. So I pull out my app, similar to actually what a lot of us probably do today with Instacart or Amazon, pick up the groceries that I need, and then um, go about my work day, and I have the groceries delivered that night. So, so these are the two scenarios I just described, the nightmare and the utopian. And they're highly dependent on the level of vehicle and ride sharing that happen. So what I'm going to do is, and by the way, I, I like to point out these are very extreme scenarios. Um, likely in the future we'll have somewhere in the middle, but what I, what I believe is that the government's role is really important for influencing where on the spectrum that we are. So um, I want to lay out what could happen in these extreme scenarios, what the impacts are to our society. So in both cases, safety would be extremely improved because you have fully driverless societies. So you're going to have you're going to eliminate those human-driven accidents. Um, in both cases, vehicle miles traveled will likely go up. Um, obviously, in the nightmare scenario, you have huge potential increases. Even in the driverless utopia, even in a fully shared society, most models predict that there will still be some increase, and that's just due to kind of like the, the circulating fleet and some time to pick up people and that kind of thing. Um, greenhouse gas emissions are forecasted to go down. What I find really interesting is that just about every study assumes that with driverless vehicles we're going to have electric um, fuel. And these technologies are being developed entirely separately. So um, it is a huge assumption to say that greenhouse gas emissions are going to go down with driverless vehicles, but I do hope that that's true. Um, urban sprawl, like I said, could go up significantly with driverless vehicles with um, the nightmare scenario. Parking requirements, well, in the nightmare scenario, it might not change that much from today. Um, because in that scenario, it's actually pretty similar to how we use vehicles today with owner, continued ownership of um, our own cars. In the utopian scenario, however, we could have way less parking requirements, which is huge when you think about the impacts to our downtowns. Um, roadway maintenance requirements will likely be improved either way with the idea that driverless vehicles have much smoother acceleration and deceleration, so the impacts to our roadways will be less. They also had someone point out to me that, that because driverless vehicles will know exactly where to travel, you could have deeper ruts 
and the road because it'll be on the exact same spot every time. So I guess that's debatable. Um, and finally, low income mobility. Um, you know, in the driverless utopia scenario, the idea that there's a really rich, reliable, dense transit system, and that has po very significant positive impacts for low income mobility. Um, in the nightmare scenario, that it is possible that with everyone having driverless vehicles, public transit could literally only exist for the lowest, lowest um, kind of, um, um, segment of our population, and it could be very, very minimal. So low income mobility could go down significantly. So our future streets, I'll just go very quickly. Um, you know, especially with the idea with a shared fleet, um, if parking needs were to go down, that's estimated to take about 15 to 20 percent of our city streets, um, of our sorry, of our city land. So when you think about what that opens up for potential of what you could do with that land, um, it's huge. And, and similarly, something like 30 percent of traffic in our downtowns is due to circulation of people looking for parking. So if you eliminate that. You also have extreme decreases in congestion, or decreases in congestion. So, um, future suburbs, it's really kind of fun to think about, you know, um, people's houses without any driveways. Um, and the other thing is you can limit potentially driverless deliveries to be only at night. So, you get really a more of a community feel during the day because you don't have anything but lo local traffic coming through. So, um, there are a lot of kind of images like this out there. Um, and then next steps. So um, this was really the crux of what I was focused on is what can government do to start to influence this? Because technology developers and automakers, they are moving forward basically with or without you. <laughs> um, they're out there and they're developing this very, very quickly. It's making this very exciting. It's following the news literally this every week. Um, but from a government perspective, what can the government do? So I thought of it like we need to kind of divvy up what does the federal government need to focus on and what does state and local governments need to focus on. And at the federal level, I think it's most important to think about the things that need to happen consistently across the states. This is a huge bone of contention right now is that right now we have a patchwork of, of regulations that happen state by state. It's very difficult for technology developers to advance the technology if they're going to have to think about different regulations from one state to another. So at the federal level, having consistent regulations around safety, you know, what are going to be the rules on driver's licenses and seatbelts, um, privacy and data sharing, cybersecurity, there are quite a few federal initiatives going on right now. Um, you may or may not be talking about that. So, um, and, and really anything around standards that really should be addressed consistently across the country. Um, when it comes to the state and local role, um, it's really, basically, you need, these areas need to focus on things that are going to be different but by region by region. So mobility, how do you address the vehicle miles travel impact? Um, infrastructure, so seemingly you don't have any infrastructure impacts with driverless vehicles since the technology does not rely on any kind of communication from the roadway. However, when you think about, um, even now with Uber and Lyft, I would imagine this is true, just like in San Francisco, where you have Ubers and Lyfts constantly dropping off on these major roadways, and you have traffic buildup from people, you know, cars built up on the side. So having more pickup and drop off locations is gonna be really important. It's also likely that there's going to be changes in speed, um, um, speed limits, um, changes to traffic signals. I mean, just the way that, that uh, vehicles travel is going to change, so infrastructure will need to adjust as well. Um, and then transit. I like to say that transit is going through an identity crisis even today. Um, transit agencies are going to need to really rethink how they're putting services out there. Everything from the vehicles that they use, are they going to turn their fleet into a driverless fleet, um, all the way to what service they provide. Um, it's quite possible, I mean, the like, you know, are already kind of challenging the traditional transit model, that traditional fixed route service may not be the answer in all different kinds of dense areas or different levels of density. Um, and finally, the financial implications. These are huge. Um, think about how many cities in our country rely on speed ticket revenues for their, um, for their towns. Speeding tickets would likely be a thing of the past. So um, that's a huge one, sales tax revenues. When it comes to vehicle ownership, if we see a decrease in vehicle ownership, the sales tax revenues that comes from selling cars could go down significantly. And that's a government, government revenue stream. Um, at the same time, costs could change as well. So there's a wide range there. So what can be done now, and I will zip through these, but I think it's super important that government at all levels stays really educated on what's going on. 
So that's doing everything from following the news, following my blog, um, just just staying up to date since things are changing so quickly. But the other key piece of it, jumping to another piece in here, is developing partnerships and relationships with the technology developers and the automakers um, because they need you just as much as you need them. That's always the message I think is so important to take away. Um, right now there are quite there are a few places that are private companies developing the technology that have partnered with the public to be able to use um, public testing grounds. So for example, in the Bay Area, Momentum Station um, had, is a partnership between Contra Costa Transportation Authority and um, where, because they have their old naval weapons uh, military site, um, and they're having Honda and other um, companies do testing there. So it's a really nice example of a partnership where they're able to kind of um, share information and establish that relationship now while the technology is still under development. Um, I think it's very important to incorporate driverless vehicles into an agency's goals. Even if you don't know what the future will be, just acknowledging that they're coming um, and then starting to incorporate them, the positives, into what you want to see. So if you want to see a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, then you want to see a reduction in vehicle mass travel and use more electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, establish policies and plans for consideration for the future. Um, you know, right now, I think we've heard this before, most plans, most MPO plans, but you, you know, city plans, et cetera, do not even acknowledge driverless vehicles that are coming. So um, incorporating them in is really important. And then ride sharing, really important. There is no reason why we can't be ride sharing now. This is why my other hat of running the ride share program in the Bay Area is kind of very relevant because um, encouraging carpooling and getting more people to share rides now and building that mindset is just as important now as it will be in the future. So um, with that, I will just share some contact information. I'm constantly posting um, news related to driverless vehicles on my Twitter feed, so please feel free to follow me. I maintain a blog, and if you're interested in the guide that I made for government agencies, the best way to get at it, since that URL is really messy, is to go to my blog, Driving Towards Driverless, um, and get access to it there. So I don't, I don't know if we're doing questions now or after. Okay, so thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Um, so as somebody who just drove part of the way across country last week, I can appreciate not only hotels, but uh, the desire to have driverless vehicles. Um, I thought that the new, I thought of a new slogan for Kansas where it should be restful and relaxing, no turns required. <laughs> it really is, you know, you basically set your cruise control so you have some level of automation, if you want to think of it that way. Some, some aspect of your car is controlled for you. And you are basically keeping the car straight. And that's all you're doing. So uh, I work for the Volpe Center uh, right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, ho hopefully most of you know of us. If you don't, please come by and visit sometime. Um, and I'm here today to talk about what the federal role is in automation. And um, I want to just say my remarks here are uh, my thoughts and my and my comments, and not necessarily representative of the Volpe Center, the Department of Transportation, or the U.S. government. So, with, with that with that said, I can I can say say, say more than I than I would if I had to follow <laughs> exact party marks. Speaking for the president, that's why we invite you. Yes, I didn't check to see if this is an approved time or not. So I'm not sure. All right, so briefly a bit about the Volpe Center. We are right down the street. It was a very short, brief walk here today. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, MIT, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, we are 570 federal employees, over 400 uh, contract folks, and we are a wide variety of uh, support to various parts of the Department of Transportation. We provide engineering, information technology, economists, policy planners, um, and most importantly, we advance slides automatically. We, um, we are fee for service. So what we do is we work on behalf of other parts of the Department of Transportation. So we support all different modes and we pride ourselves in being multimodal. And so what I'll talk about today will cross several modes of the Department of Transportation and touch upon um, several aspects. Okay, so I'm really happy that I followed Lauren because I get to skip all of the stuff I normally have to do, which is what is an automated vehicle, what are the different
different levels, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, but I want to remind folks that there are a lot of different um, contrasting points of view here and a lot of different um, possible futures. And um, one of the key things that um, we want to do is really look at the opportunities across all the different folks who are going to be impacted, which is everybody, and make sure that nobody is left behind. So basically we want to think about some of the opportunities, but also some of the, shall we say, mistakes that were highlighted in the past in terms of how private vehicles um, have gone into our transportation system and some of the challenges that they've brought about. So the US DOT is doing a lot in the automated vehicle space. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but I want to spend a little bit of time highlighting some of the activities that we're taking part in, and then I'll spend the last part of my uh, presentation on some of the reflections to a, to a local level that we've seen, again, from our federal support. So um, here's a picture of Secretary Fox getting out of uh, one of the automated vehicles when he made a visit out to the Bay Area, uh, one of Google's vehicles. And he has taken a great interest in automated vehicles, and as has the administration because of this, the importance and the pace with which development has been happening. And he has committed the department to provide guidance on the safe deployment of and ultimately state um, recommendations on the deployment of uh, automated vehicles. Uh, that was a declaration he made in January, and there'll be additional guidance coming on that topic uh, next month, um, which I'm really excited to see. I actually am not personally involved in it, so I'm really excited to see what, um, what comes from that and what help that provides answer some of these key questions that we have. There's also, um, and I'll speak in more detail about this, several other initiatives that he's focused on that help not only uh, enhance equity, but also push forward the deployment of some of these technologies here in the United States because there is a very international uh, interest in this and we want to make sure that the United States stays a technological leader in this area. So one of the concepts I thought was important to uh, speak about here today uh, amongst this audience was this connecting folks to opportunity. And there was a challenge that the secretary launched um, about this concept where he wanted to make sure that folks were not forgetting about those who have um, the social inequities and the challenge for low income and other folks. So um, while we that can't necessarily address everything that's been done in the past, we want to make sure that we take these principles forward in the future. So there's been a couple of different, I mentioned there's a couple of different uh, initiatives going on. Hopefully folks have heard about the Smart City Challenge. Uh, it was a very successful um, initial launch. We had 78 cities who were interested in participating in this program. Um, up for grabs was $40 million to the, win to the winning city with an additional $10 million provided by the Vulcan Foundation and some other partners as well. And there are 12 key elements here. Um, I want to highlight the fact that of the top three, um, automation was one of the top three and in fact listed first. So we have high hopes, currently there are seven um, semi-finalists with the announcement for the winner to come, I believe it will be this week, it may be next week, but I, I hear through the, uh, through the grapevine from DC that that will be coming um, this week. And we're very hopeful that there will be a significant automation element to this program. And we hope that this will also be an example um, for all the different uh, cities and towns who are also interested in this um, to see some model deployment and see how it can be implemented um, on a fast track. Similarly, and that, so that was Smart City Challenge is obviously city focused. Similarly, there's another program called the Fast Act Grants. So this is looking at a competitive grant program over five years, $60 million, um, where this is not necessarily tied to cities, but tied to anything where there can be um, 
opportunity, and I'll, I'll just point out that this is you know, listed in here specifically, are, um, I'll remove some of the government acronyms here, so excuse me, V2V or vehicle to vehicle technology or V2I, vehicle to infrastructure technology, different ways of communicating with the, with the infrastructure, and there also is an encouragement of autonomous vehicles and collision avoidance systems. The third and final that I'll speak about in terms of uh, deployment opportunities um, is the Mobility on Demand Sandbox. And this is um, led by our partners at the Federal Transit Administration. This is uh, an $8 million program where, again, Lauren talked about some of the opportunities where um, there's a lot going on in the mobility space in terms of technology and what it can do to enable new opportunities for folks to connect with transportation and, and have it um, provide a better service to them. So this is an opportunity for those folks to look at personal mobility and how technology can help enhance that. And again, more information available at that link. And this is, an on this is ongoing. Uh, I believe it's open for several weeks. All right, so in my day-to-day -day role, uh, I primarily support part of the Department of Transportation called the Intelligent Transportation Systems Joint Program Office. Of course, too many words, so they make it an acronym in the government, ITSJPO. Within there, the automation program is one of several building blocks, and we have three pillars uh, of the work for automation. The first is foundational policy research. And that's connected to targeted technical research. So the areas where the government feels it's important that we are doing research. Obviously, there's a large body of work out there that's happening already, but where the government, federal government, has to play an important role. Then the last piece, and again, these are all interconnected, is stakeholder collaboration. So uh, events like this, talking about what the government is doing and how we can help. All right, so I'll briefly, I know we're uh, running short on time, talk about the three areas, and then I'll conclude again with local remarks. So um, hopefully, and I encourage folks to Google this, uh, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. So these are the regulations about what equipment and what safety elements need to be on your vehicle to make it roadworthy and certifiable in the United States. Um, we provided support on a review of the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards to understand whether as automated technologies come into the fleet, are there inconsistencies as one thinks about a concept of a driver? Who is the driver as we start to move towards this? And are there, are there roadblocks in current government regulations that would prevent them, and how, how might those be changed? Additionally, on a, on, a, on a roadway side, we provide support to FHWA, or the Federal Highway Administration, on developing their policy needs. So reaching out to their stakeholders at a state and local level to understand, again, how automated vehicles are going to affect our roadways and how they may need to adapt. On the targeted technical research side, again, I'm just providing a few highlights. There's more information um, in each of these areas. Um, I think one of the most important things that we do um, is our benefits evaluation. So we coined this more around the term impacts because as we've, as we've seen, there are both benefits and potential disbenefits to automation in terms of the challenges it provides. So creating an understanding of all the different pieces and safety being the driving force from the Department of Transportation perspective in terms of what our, what our first and highest goal is, but all the interrelationships between several other aspects of what could change. We talk about vehicle miles traveled, environmental consequences, land use in terms of are our downtowns going to get more dense and are we going to need less parking or are we going to get an expansion where folks can live several hours away from work or some combination of. So understanding all the connections between there, we're developing models that will feed in these different scenarios and tell you and start to help answer some of these questions so we can make informed policy decisions. Also, and I mentioned some of these technologies of communication. Communication is one of the key aspects uh, of automated vehicles. So autonomous means you don't necessarily need any connections. But we see a future where some level of connection, whether it's to the cloud, other vehicles, or a combination of is very important. So there's research ongoing uh, in terms of high speed and high um, performance um, vehicle to vehicle communication 
for platooning. So coming down the highway as a group and in coordination so you can get closer headways, potentially higher speed, but in, an, but in a safe manner. And lastly, stakeholder coordination. So I spoke about, I'm here today to do part of that, but there's a very large effort behind the scenes that focuses on a national level in terms of all the different modes I've started to speak about today, but also on an international level. So there's a lot of activity happening now, and frankly, more a lot more dollars being spent uh, internationally, both in Europe and Japan. So coordinating with those folks in terms of uh, the research that they're doing, but also um, ultimately, hopefully, we're working on data sharing agreements and otherwise, so that we can all uh, move the technology forward as quickly as possible. Uh, one quick plug here for uh, next month uh, out in the Bay Area again. Uh, one of the one of the hubs, along with what we think here in Kendall Square, is another hub of automated vehicle work. Is the Automated Vehicle Symposium, where this topic will be discussed among what we expect to be over a thousand participants uh, in downtown San Francisco. Okay, so what does this all mean for for all of us here in the room today? Um, as I started to think about this and, and put together um, sort of some summary thoughts and slides, and, and uh, I'm not, I, I shouldn't say that I'm old enough to have watched this in anything but reruns, but I thought of Get Smart, and I immediately thought of his shoe phone. And if anybody can remember that, you know, he had a, he had a shoe that had a built-in telephone, and that was how he would communicate, his, the secret agent would communicate back to headquarters and otherwise. And that seemed so revolutionary and technologically <laughs> impossible. Now, I haven't seen anybody implement that currently. <laughs> Obviously, technology uh, has advanced to the point where we easily could do that. But why? <laughs> but ultimately, it's a good example of, you know, so there was, there was, a, there was a picture of the future. This, this secret agent who had this ability to communicate with folks anytime he needed to in a, well, not so covert way by picking up his phone, <laughs> but he had that capability. So we look now at automated vehicles and we think they offer all these great opportunities, but we don't necessarily know how they're going to roll out. The technology and the amount of money and effort uh, being spent in this area is huge, and it certainly is coming. How it's coming, we don't necessarily know. So by, by, by attending here today and learning more about the technology, you guys are doing a fantastic job about getting educated. So that's, that's step number one, is learn more about the technology. The second is find out what's happening locally. So again, we'll talk, at, uh, I'll be followed by America to Tone, we'll talk more about some of, the, uh, some of the events and some of the opportunities that are happening here uh, and right around you. But continue to stay engaged in those because those are really important. What your local community is doing is, is as important as what's happening nationally and internationally. And lastly, and I word this carefully, consider the long-term impacts. We do not know exactly what is coming and how it's coming. I wish that that crystal ball would, uh, would become clearer and we could see what exactly, is, what exactly we have in front of us. But over the past year, what I do know is that the drumbeat of news and information has only increased. And we see more and more press releases about mergers and about um, projections about what's going to come. And keep in mind that these are companies that are ultimately going to be selling a service and a product. So of course there's a bit of spin and um, forethought to what they're doing, but it's definitely coming. Um, I'll encourage everybody to keep in mind equity and access for all. Again, through a lot of what the DOT is focused on, that's one of the key areas where we need to make sure that we don't drop the ball uh, on what, what, what our possibilities are. I'll also say that we talk about this in a very broad term, but these don't have to be all-encompassing national, international plans. AVs are ultimately going to come out in one area, one, in one application, and think of them as they could potentially be limited in scope, whether it's technologically in terms of what the technology can do, um, or it could be geogra geographically. There could be a service that only works on particular road, particular approved roads or in particular environments, and that could be an that could be an opportunity. So these don't 
this isn't sort of an all or nothing, um, all or nothing endeavor. Um, as you look at um, how this may impact your local communities, think about it um, in a phase approach as well. Lauren talked about some of the timeline here and also some of the, some of the challenges of you know, the average vehicle age is 11 years, typical replacement is more around the 17 to year time frame. These vehicles don't turn over very quickly. So even if the technology does prove itself very strong and very capable in the near term, it's going to take a while. So we will be in a mixed use environment. So how that plays out and how you plan step by step is important. And lastly, um, consider your regulatory environment. Lauren mentioned some of the patchwork that exists right now. The government announcement next month should help, should help provide um, some clarification on state roles and federal roles in terms of the safe deployment of vehicles, reg regulation, and testing. But these are, um, these are changing times, and the local is very important as well. So lastly, uh, I, didn't, I didn't confirm, but I'm very glad that I had a different picture of Kendall Square than you, than you did. Um, I made sure to pick one where it was long enough ago that you can see it is a very different place, but recent enough that my fair building is, exists in the picture, so Volpe <laughs> is there, um, but surrounded by uh, industrial area and parking lots. So we'll, we'll hear more about what's happening in Somerville, but right here in Kendall Square, there's a lot going on. We saw the talk, we saw the numbers about traffic and how that has remain steady, but we also, as somebody who uh, bikes to work on a daily basis, I can say that bike traffic has increased dramatically. We know that the red line loads are significantly higher. So this, this change that we're seeing in the building up of the area and more folks coming in hasn't impacted vehicle traffic, or at least from what I've seen, has at least kept it moving. But how will AVs change that? One of the futures that, that Lauren presented was this movement and this drop off and the potential for increased vehicle miles traveled because people are coming in and out. So we currently regulate and, and maintain things usually because market demands and parking restrictions and parking costs. But if parking costs disappeared and all you had to do was get dropped off and your vehicle went somewhere else to park, how would that impact Kendall Square? And I'll leave you with that sort of local example and local thought, thought to chew on, and then I will pass it to the good man. Thanks, Mark. I was going to apologize for being late, but if former colleague and former member of Amesbury, Thatcher Kiza, um, reminded me that mayors are never late, they're just delayed elsewhere, so thanks, guys. <laughs> if I had no offense to the officer assigned me, if I had an autonomous vehicle, we'd be here 15 minutes earlier. But, it is what it is. Uh, thanks, it's great to be here. Um, I find this topic exciting. Uh, we've been curious and some of all about the future mobility and to call it a day for us as now more than half the world's population lives in the city of city regions by 2050, three quarters of the world's population. And those regions who can take on the legacy issues of housing and health and sustainability and mobility and plan and build that future, they will excel and succeed, and those who don't, uh, we believe and submit, will be left behind. So we all know, we've heard in delivery, there is a mobility revolution on the way that is being led by the urban core. Uh, half the global population, and this is the population shift, and we've seen the greatest demographic shift in urbanization in this country you know, since mid-century. Those people shifting to the cities, they want to commute on foot, by bike, by good public transit, not just by the car. Uh, and uh, field policies of the past that only prioritized private vehicles no longer meet those urban needs or future goals. So, like any technology, AVCV infrastructure is likely to be on the way positive and negative implication in cities. So, uh, Somerville is extremely proud to be part of the estimated 5% of the cities that are proactively planning for this inevitable future. Uh, and it is going to come. I really recall a story of a friend of mine told me he was a, in business school and the professor said something, you know that internet thing is really going to take off. <laughs> it's really going to take off. It's going to come. It's a bit the same as here, but these technologies have to and must fit in with our own community's vision for itself. And some of our community-based planning is second to none. We know who we are, we know what we want to be when we grow up, so 
Let me begin my remarks with a quick discussion of how Samoa thinks about mobility, and let me credit uh, Ian Lockwood, the great traffic engineer, urban design cartoonist, for helping him to capture this topic in the cartoons on these slides. And Ian has worked in some of on a couple of Complete Streets projects, including uh, advising us on our Complete Street ordinance, which was the first of its uh, kind in Massachusetts. Somerville has committed itself to a zero carbon future. Now, does uh, anyone here live in Somerville? Well, we all, uh, all right, great, great. We'll take care of you guys at the end. Uh, you've either lived, through there, lived in some or you're driven through there, what I find when I travel around the country. <laughs> so those of you who uh, live in some of have probably heard about you know, the sustainability um, policy initiatives, like our Green Tech program, and things we've done, like other communities, like styrofoam or plastic bag bands. But and these, of course, are important. But to make an impact at scale, bold impact, uh, we must uh, tackle vehicle emissions. Earlier this year, uh, the city published our first ever greenhouse gas inventory. And uh, one third of some of this carbon footprint is generated by vehicle traffic, auto and truck trips that start or end in some of them. Uh, that's nearly a quarter million tons of carbon emissions. So as we plan for choices in mobility, we must frame those policy discussions around our uh, sustainability and climate uh, resilience uh, goals. Somerville prides itself on being a leader in public health policy. We adopted, along with our partners at Tufts, the first ever community-based systems approach to reversing the trends of childhood obesity in a generation, which was the model for Let's Move. Um, it's been a worldwide model. That means uh, tackling the infrastructure and the policies that build up the systems or break down or leave void the systems around mobility. Uh, in an effort to make walking and biking not just a choice of a necessity of need, but the easy choice. The city has also partnered with uh, Tufts University on the CAFE Research Initiative on the impact of vehicle emissions on health. And what we found is really startling. The I-93 corridor carries more than 200,000 cars through environmental justice zones and some of them on a daily basis. So I want you to picture some of them around mid-century and sort of the demographics of the time in our country. We are in the midst of the greatest demographic shift in this country since mid-century. Mid-century, some of them have just, sh just short of 20, 20 rail and trolley stops. And great policymakers of the, day, of the day took it away. Took them all away, every single one. And we didn't get one back until 84 in Davis Square, the red line stop. And recently, the first one that come up in almost 30 years, the Orange Line Station, an assembly in still the Green Line, but they took them away. They brought in I-93, uprooted hundreds of homes, thousands of people, Expanded Route 28, the secondary activity started cutting people off from one another, cut ourselves off from good and, uh, and, and affordable food choices, impeding our mobility, impeding our economic vitality, and we suffered from it. Epidemiologists, epidemiologists have documented increased prevalence of asthma, cardiovascular disease, a stroke, and premature death among our residents linked to particulates and vehicle exhaust because we've been sucking the poisoning for generations. And that is unconscionable. Uh, and more than two dozen peer reviewed journal articles have been published documenting this research. So you better believe that we think, and some of us think, uh, mobility is a public health issue and a health equity issue. For us, it's literally a matter of life and death. Social equity, as has been alluded to, also drives our mobility goals. Everyone knows that Metro Boston has a regional housing crisis, and Mark Dreesen uh, and MEPC. I uh, did some research on this. the thing that we need in this region, the greater Boston metropolitan region, the sixth most congested region in these United States, 435,000 units of housing by, by 2040. And uh, that's tremendous. Our social fabrics, uh, fabric in some and all our communities is under extreme pressure with the wave of urbanization. And the issues of housing affordability and displacement, truly, I'll tell you, any mayor in this region, any leader, keeps me up at night. But the housing crisis should really be framed and viewed through the lens of mobility planning. I mean, the ULI estimates that the cost of private vehicle ownership in some of those is, a, is more than $8,000 per year. Now, that's a dominant component of a household budget. If you think of what whatever middle income is today, and housing prices in some of those that is the hottest market city in the US, but uh, there comes uh, tremendous negativity and pressures with that as well. 
What's amazing that is in Medford or Arlington, where fewer mobility choices exist, the costs are estimated at more than $11,000 per year. So if our mobility planning helps small households go from two vehicles, which I'm at, to one, and if I didn't have four boys playing hockey, I'd definitely get one today, Mark, or from one to zero, uh, that's a significant part of an affordability strategy. When uh, Secretary uh, Paul Eckert Mastel was at the Dukaki Center, she helped publish a study that described the vicious cycle in cities building new public transit, where light bill extensions raise real estate prices, higher income residents move into a neighborhood with new transit service, uh, these new residents own more vehicles and they, and they bring them and they use them instead of newly built public transit. Uh, so the policy recommendation, let me get parking. Um, and can you mitigate some of the worst impacts? We still have this struggle in some of them. There's still a cultural struggle and border skirmishes. We're going to build a cycle track. We still have people in the city think, I can get a parking spot for, uh, for every bedroom. We still have some zoning data squares, much, much of you will law that is a model of smart growth in GOD. I think it's by accident. There's still zoning in place that requires that any ground floor use uh, to a parking spot for every 100 square feet. Uh, we couldn't envision data square back a quarter century ago as having all these open French cafe windows and such, and such a vibrant sidewalk life and, uh, and lifestyle. But there's a pattern emerging here, right? Uh, is anyone some, in some of uh, What's anyone here familiar who live in the city with some of those recent road diet projects at East Broadway or Beacon Street? Okay, good. We have heard from small business owners, as I just uh, alluded to, that economic vitality depends on automobile capacity and extensive parking. No, that's wrong. Get that out of your heads. <laughs> Research is showing the opposite. In urban neighborhoods, bicyclists and pedestrians spend more money than drivers do, and we see that with the trend of urbanization. This is why people want to live deep in the urban core connected to lifestyle and culture. Uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg and his DOT commissioner, Janet Sadiq Khan, understood this very well. They established a research framework for tracking small business performance in all five boroughs in New York City, and it proves this point, as do numerous other studies from other cities. And there's plenty of data from Brookings, especially this. A higher bike pet count, an increase in bike and foot traffic is good for business, the better your local economic activity and vitality and performance. Last um, uh, but not least, where the car is king, as we know and we have heard, is improved public life and social cohesion suffer. How many in here have read uh, Happy City by uh, Charles Montgomery? Oh, the sun, very good. And some of all, we become the first I believe, city in the world uh, to systematically measure happiness. Uh, there's a rigorous science behind it. And uh, we've worked together with Professor Daniel Gilbert and our partners at Harvard on the leading edge of that research. And we have found that auto-oriented neighborhoods are less happy than walkable neighborhoods. Uh, we've also been working with Jan Gill's research team out of Copenhagen to evaluate the quality of our Plazas, sidewalks, and public spaces. No surprise when urban design promotes walking and biking, more residents use these public spaces. And I'd submit to you uh, that some of those traditions of civic pride, tolerance, and participation are reinforced when uh, neighbors meet neighbors in public spaces, when not just blurred images of motor vehicles and windows of motor vehicles driving by us. And that's really important as we think about planning and building healthy, productive neighborhoods and communities for people, people to a human sphere, who own the streets, to build that social capital and that social equity. We think that you're happy, you're healthy, and you're more productive. So through that lens, how can AV and auto auto autonomous vehicle, connected vehicle technology fit in? Uh, so when I read about this stuff in the newspaper, the coverage sometimes makes me think of Robert Moses or the like Corbusier rising from the dead. Fleets of high-speed robot cars, uh, traffic lights time to maximize a vehicle throughput. Uh, this dystopian image where cars, not people, dominate the landscape is not <laughs> consistent at all with some of those vision. So we have a choice. We can ignore what's coming, or we can engage it and mold it and drive it. And you can guess the choice I made as mayor or the choice we have made as a community. Some of it uh, was part of a worldwide competition uh, by Audi, sponsored by Audi, called the Audi Urban Future Initiative. We were one of, uh, though we weren't the winners of that competition, we were still one of four cities selected worldwide in 2014 
uh, to develop a partnership with Audi, and we've been doing so ever since. Now, it's only taken a few decades, but the automobile manufacturers have begun planning for disruptive technologies, climate change, and urbanization, asking themselves, what is the future of mobility? Reconcile with the future of urbanization. What is the future of the automobile? And we are extremely proud that our partners are, as at Audi have a forward-looking vision for that company. They know that their business model must evolve or the business will fail. So think about the sharing economy like, you need to think about the sharing economy like Uber or Airbnb. Think about the internet of things, as I mentioned. Think about pocket accidents and congestion pricing. Audi is in, and so are most of their competitors. And they need to perform research in urban environments. And some of all really represents a perfect test lab or test kitchen, or as we call it, a mobility lab to try these ideas because of our density, because of our street makeup, because of our housing stuff. We are small enough in terms of land area, and we're the most densely populated city in New England, and our population is growing. We are nimble enough in terms of management and bureaucracy, and we're progressive enough in terms of data-driven decision making. Audi has brought its own urban designers and traffic engineers and software engineers to our community. They have two initial areas of focus for pilot projects. The first is related to traffic management systems. You know, how many of you here use the Waze app? Okay, so it's a, or a similar system when you drive. Good. It's like, as you all know, a crowdsourcing roadway and traffic data. <clears throat> Audi and its competitors have been developing roadside uh, sensors and traffic signal systems that can communicate with smartphones and onboard our computers, uh, computers and automobiles. And in 2017, uh, we will be deploying this technology in some of those Union Square uh, with our partners at Audi. Uh, the Audi partnership has indeed been very timely for us. In Union Square, uh, we're right now replacing four sets of traffic signal equipment. Uh, the team at Audi has advised us on various hardware and software uh, specifications for the signal controllers. And it's really cool that uh, Lauren and Jonathan are serving as my fellow panels today uh, because the city's staff has been working with both Parsons Brinker Hop and USDOT's uh, Volpe Center to better understand these technologies and ensure that we procure the right equipment that works today, it's cost effective, and is compatible with Audi's testing, and doesn't box us into proprietary software or preclude future hardware or software upgrades. And what we've heard from folks like Lauren and Jonathan is that technology is in many ways evolving faster than the policy environment. That's no shocker, you know, bureaucracy. And we have a long way to go as a society regarding privacy protections and legal frameworks for widespread adoption of these tools. But that's why, that's why we really do the research. That's why some of it is working proactively to be part of that conversation and to hold ourselves up as a worldwide model. And the second major area of our initial research is in parking technology. Uh, most uh, folks, most of you know how outrageously expensive and how terribly inefficient structured parking tends to be. Audi believes that AV and CV technology can help minimize the footprint of parking structures. Autonomous vehicles have the potential to shrink parking shell, uh, shells and stalls and circulation space in garages. And tightly packed, a very tightly, a densely packed and tightly packed city like Somerville, where one third of our land is dedicated to vehicle needs, be it roadways or parking, this is certainly a significant need and can have a tremendously positive impact. Uh, more cost-effective, smaller garages generally means that new development is more affordable for residents and independent businesses, and that we can maximize the density and build more sustainable development in the very limited and valuable land area we have. Or that new, new, uh, badly needed new open space can be one for the community. Audi's initial pilot program uh, is in Assembly Square with our development partner, Federal Realty Investment Trust. Uh, but we see the major application in our Union Square neighborhood. Where we just adopted, the community's just adopted an official neighborhood plan uh, to guide growth and development uh, in Union Square. And while we prioritize pedestrians, bicycles, and turns and riders, private vehicles are also a part of Union Square's mobility future. The question is how big a part of it, how do we manage it in a very sustainable way? The district plan calls for a strategically placed district serving uh, garage facilities. And we will not make each and every development site park itself. That's important. And here in Kendall, officially managed parking structures have helped unlock more than 4 million screen of development uh, of new development. And a picture that John showed is quite dramatic. I actually remember that when I was a kid, how industrial uh, this space was. And during that same time, we see in Kendall that traffic has actually declined 
uh, by 15%. So we will learn and try to apply these lessons in Union Square and our other major development districts like the Montmagnas, the Brick Bottom, and the Belt area. But we'll also look at other municipal facilities around our civic concourse up at Central Hill High School and City Hall. So to sum up, we see a way for our autonomous vehicles to further our mobility and sustainability goals as a community. Uh, reduced emissions through more efficient uh, traffic. We all know further public health and climate change goals. Reducing the size of parking areas can drive down the cost of building housing and creating open space, but both important social and equity goals. Traffic that works better with our overall mobility options contributes to economic vitality, and we must, absolutely must, keep these goals before us as we continue to shape the future integration of autonomous vehicles into the urban core. It is really much more of a value-based discussion for our society than a technology-based discussion. Thank you very much. So, let's begin. Uh, yes, sir. I know who you are, but not everybody else does. So introduce yourself, please. Look. So waiting for the microphone. It's going to be difficult. She's doing the best she can. There we go. I'm Joe Bard, Director of Traffic Parking and Transportation for the Fair City of Cambridge. Um, I guess I'll primarily direct this at Warren, who is also a former colleague. Um, I guess, but I'll start by speaking one comment, which is that from my perspective as a roadway operator, I only see this increasing the cost to operate my infrastructure um, in terms of signals, payment markings, all that stuff that we you know, do okay with, but we just require, we require us to do a lot more with. So that will just put that out there. I guess my question is, I can say a lot of things, most of which will probably get me grounded as a Luddite, but um, in terms of the, 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 the users of the roadway that I hope will never have to be automated, meaning pedestrians and cyclists, I'm curious what you think the interaction with those will be. I know there are safety concerns, but also operational concerns from, from my perspective, you know, we are going to continue to have pedestrian signals and we're going to continue to have well-timed pedestrian signals, which means that things like adaptive signal technology don't really work that well or can't realize their full potential. So I'm curious kind of how you see those users integrating into this and, and affecting the adoption of this technology. So, nice to see you. I, um, there, was, there was actually a simulation that was put out, and I don't remember which school did it, but there was a Oh, this one, I, well, I don't know, but, but it showed um, driverless vehicles approaching an intersection and without any traffic signal. And it showed, you know, the throughput being greatly increased because the driverless cars were able to just fly, barely miss each other, and and they were they were able to kind of. And I, I imagine they used connected technology as well, so they were communicating with each other to be able to make this decision. And it looked kind of amazing to think that throughput could be increased that much. And, and I was like, where are the cyclists and the pedestrians? You know, they really ignored that side of it. So I think what we're seeing now is, is really interesting. One piece of it is um, smartphone technology and, and the equivalent that, that cyclists and pedestrians seemingly would have. I think we're starting to see increases in those technologies and, and, and how there will be communication so that the, the shared space can be kind of well communicated. So it's not so much with driverless technology be connected. Um, but on the driverless side, um, you know, Google and other companies have been getting patents for things like a fake hand that goes up to be able to say, hey, I'm gonna take a turn here. You know, so that they're actual visual cues to be able to communicate. Frankly, I think it's yet to be seen. There are, uh, there has, was an example recently where a uh, Google vehicle pulled up a stoplight next to a cyclist and the cyclist was balancing on the pedals and so, What's that? Track stop. Yeah. Track stop, yes. And the vehicle had no idea what to do with that. The, vehicle, this, this, the cyclist was kind of moving, and so the car just kept waiting, and they kind of waited for each other. And <laughs> so um, I think it just reflects that the confusion that can happen, but also the challenges that the technologists are still grappling with. Because frankly, the driverless technology, it is fully functioning and it works 98% of the time, but it's, it's the really challenging situations like that that it, they're still struggling with. So I, I, that's generally what's happening. Thank you both. Uh, how about right here? Yes, sir. Mike is coming down behind you. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Hi, I'm Ron Newman. I'm a, a, 
I was in the city of Somerville and for many years served on the bicycle committee there. Uh, I want to follow up on the last question because it seemed like the answer to the last question depended on pedestrians and cyclists carrying around technology that they might not want to be carrying around, might not, might not be able to afford, or might just not feel like you know walking around with a smartphone on all day. Uh, so it seems like we have a problem here if we're going to introduce technology to make vehicles travel better that forces technology onto uh, other road users that they don't want. Also, I haven't heard anybody say the word motorcycle. And um, motorcycles don't travel in bike lanes. They travel much faster than bicycles, and they're much less likely to be automated. How do, uh, how do they fit in? Thank you. Let me all start. Um, so um, it is very interesting to see the technology companies um, look at all of these technology companies being those interrupters who aren't going into the space now, but also the automotive manufacturers. And from a DOT perspective, we like to put the category of vulnerable road users, whether they be pedestrians, whether they be cyclists, or ultimately, um, you know, because there isn't thousands of pounds of steel around them, motorcyclists. And um, there's been a lot of effort to put towards making sure that that's uh, a priority, again, from the development side, from what we've seen publicly coming out of, for again, for instance, Google, because they're the most public. We don't necessarily know as much about some of the other uh, manufacturers and technology companies um, in terms of what they're, how they're addressing and to get to the challenging ethical questions, how they're prioritizing decisions about whether how they interact with first vehicles, but also the sort of higher threshold that they at least so far have publicly said they're assigning to pedestrians and cyclists. And a lot of their outreach videos and otherwise have focus on examples of exactly that interaction. And All right, please. I'll just add, your point is extremely well taken, and I think it just, it furthers the importance of government's role in the driverless vehicles coming into society, because the technology developers and, and auto manufacturers, they don't want accidents, but their their core mission is to sell vehicles, and or at least get people using their vehicles, and, and however they, maybe they can make money in that way. They want to do it safely, but I think it is the government's role, um, truly at all levels, to make sure that they are introduced to society safely. So um, yes, we can count on to some degree technology um, on both sides, in the vehicles and with the vulnerable users helping that, but I think it's government making sure that if parking spaces go away, that we make more, um, use that space effectively. So it's not just adding more buildings there or more lanes, but maybe putting more cycle infrastructure, things like that. Thank you both. Uh, John, right down here. And we'll have Suzanne right in front of him for some efficiency. My name is John Buxton. I'm a public service lawyer turned to last 30 years high school, public high school math teacher. In 1972-73, the United States made a concerted effort to convert to the metric system. Absolutely, unquestionably, the smart thing to do, but somehow the public was not brought along. There was not education, there was not uh, um, the benefits of this, and so on. Lauren, what can we do better this time? Great question. I mean, I think, I think building awareness because right now the messaging about driverless cars is coming from the media and it's coming from the automakers and the technology developers. So when you ask the general public, what do they know and what does it mean for them, all they know is what the mass media is telling them. And we, the mass media loves to give the headlines with you know, fatalities and, and whatever. So I think uh, government having a voice and government educating people on it and also saying where the vulnerabilities are. I mean, I th there are pros and cons to this technology but going out in front and actually having a voice about it is really important. Do you have such programs that you're working on, TV, <coughs> whatever, that, uh, that educate people about this? I mean, as a company, we are working with government agencies to incorporate this into their plans and their outreach, um, and we are working on any projects with this. And But I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not pervasive by any means. <laughs> Susan, I think oh, that's, sorry. I think that's important, and I, I will 
little point that's not um, necessarily payment related, but there is a website called My Car Does What. And it explains all types of safety technologies and other pieces of technology on vehicles, and it includes things like some of the now automated systems. That's not going to make it to the wide population. Right. Suzanne, please. Good morning, Suzanne Rasmussen, Director of Environmental Transportation Planning for the City of Cambridge. And I have actually two questions, if I may. Um, the first question relates to the fact that cars now, according to research, sit idle 90% of the time. So there's plenty of time to whiz around and buy milk at Whole Foods and coffee at Trader Joe's. And you can, be, you can really imagine that it could be driving those other 90% of the time. But to what extent does uh, economics put a damper to that nightmare scenario? Because it's not free for that car to drive around. If you have fuel costs that could go up 90%. So that's one question. And the other question relates to safety. I think uh, it's always stated universally that this would be much, much, much safer. But I think about uh, tequila airbags, uh, not so safe. And you can imagine that if this technology is deployed and you have mass production and you have that kind of failure, you could have some very, very scary scenarios out on the road. So I'm, I'm just I guess I'm a little bit surprised that no one seems to talk about uh, that kind of mass failure scenario, uh, but rather uh, seems to think that it would only be safer. Well, we're going to talk about it today. All right, two questions. Who would like to take them? Uh, Tony? I'll, I'll try the first one, Great. which is um, that I think regarding the economics of how trip making takes place, there's a couple of different things that play into this. So one is the um, you know, the, the, the difference of if, if you're switching from a system in which people own a car, in which they buy their mobility up front, versus a scenario in which, and again, this is all conditional, right? Because you don't know which direction it's going to go, to a system in which they're purchasing mobility on demand. The economics of those individual trips changes or has the potential to change. Because right now, if you own a vehicle, it's relatively cheap for you to drive it wherever you want to go as your default transportation mode, because you've already paid up front for the vehicle itself, you've paid up front for the insurance, you've paid up front for a place to garage it, and so all of those costs are loaded up on the very, uh, the very act of owning a vehicle and having access to it as your primary mobility mode. Whereas if you're accessing mobility as a service, those economics shift a little bit, and how they shift is yet to be determined, but it's an important thing to be thinking about. The second thing is that, um, you know, and this has been raised by a couple of folks already today. Right now, it is generally the case that people drive and have free access to the roads, with the exception of toll roads, um, in ways that are not necessarily beneficial for everybody. So folks have mentioned congestion pricing and road pricing and access to the roads. And I think if you're looking to damp down or prevent this explosion of VMT scenario that some people have talked about today, that conversation about how we price access to the roads and price access to parking suddenly becomes really very important. And Suzanne, that you covered sort of both. Anything else to add? Well, major the, system failure. I mentioned the point of major system failure. Uh, it's by no means unique to. I'm not saying this as a as a advocate for AVs per se, because I'm not necessarily. It's by no means. It is that are susceptible to this. Our entire economy is digital and is the resilience of it and the security of it and so forth. So our cars taking over and drowning themselves into telephone poles, certainly a security concern. Our 401ks disappearing into we don't know where, also a security concern. So I you know I, I hope we can deal with that, but whether there will be violations of the, the that security is almost undoubtedly in some sense. But I don't know how precarious it is vis-a-vis other risks to the economy. We're going to switch over here and then go to the middle for a little while, okay? And Jonathan, right? Hi, uh, Jonathan Matt from Matt Associates. I um, work with the city of Boston and several states on their climate plan. So this is a follow-up to Suzanne's question, and maybe for Lauren and, and the mayor. Um, how do, what are the types of policies that the cities and states should be thinking of that would help guide us more towards, I think, Lauren, your utopian view um, where uh, 
these vehicles are um, shared and pooled. Um, it seems like it needs to be around inconvenience and pricing, but what are the types of things really that cities and states should be starting to think of now that will move us towards the utopian vision, because otherwise it's going to be a greenhouse gas disaster. Yeah. So that's, that's the crux of the guide that I mentioned that I developed is, is a whole bunch of policy recommendations around this, but the policy recommendations range from adding more high occupancy, high occupancy vehicle lanes, express lanes, um, um, looking at your parking policies, you know, reducing the minimum requirements that you have at apartment buildings and then really any kind of buildings, um, looking at the, um, the uh, taxes that you have in place, so parking taxes, sales taxes, putting them in place in a way that both incentivizes sharing and disincentivizes private vehicle trips and or ownership and or parking. So it, it's, it's a whole gamut, but thinking through really the, it's getting right back to that initial point. Um, first, that some cost of purchasing a vehicle, making that prohibitive, but then when you're on the ongoing usage, right now, you know, when the cost of fuel is low, that your ongoing usage is, uh, humans, you know, don't even think they're paying anything when they currently get into their vehicles. But uh, when you feel the pain of every ride, it's different. So um, just building policies around all of that. Yeah, I can, uh, uh, and I agree with that. I think overall our policies need to be bold and not do what we presently do as institutional governments, as public agencies, dance around the edges. Um, regionally, we're all trying to understand what our own city It's very parochial, it's very provincial, but as a region, we have not made a bold enough state. You know, uh, some of them want to be carbon neutral, but it can't be one city. Uh, we could be the carbon neutral metropolitan region and lead the standard for the world, and that's where those standards are being set worldwide. It's not happening at the state level, it's not even happening at the federal level, it's the city regions that will set that standard. The worst case scenario, as you talked about uh, greenhouse gas uh, nightmare, disaster, is based on our conduct today, because it's not bold. It can't be some technology implementation itself. We have to set bold goals, take bold measures, to if we have bold impact on the road. I don't think resiliency alone is going to get us. The gondolas in the back bay alone ain't going to do it. Yeah, and can I, I want to add one thing to reinforce that when I put together all the policy recommendations in my guide, um, what I thought was so kind of amusing and disappointing is that every recommendation was relevant today before driverless vehicles are even here. There's nothing that is so specific to driverless vehicles that we have to wait. Um, so, yes, completely agree. Well, a lot of those policy recommendations would be good ones to follow anyway, no matter how quickly we move on to driverless vehicles, so I think that's an important point worth noting. I'm actually going to ask a question, which I think is a follow-up on, on some of these points. What about the cars themselves and the likelihood that the technology will be more greenhouse gas friendly or less greenhouse gas friendly than what we see presently? We see some advancement now in fits and starts with improved technology. Uh, are we likely to see more of that, less of that? And again, what can government do to try and move that along? If anyone likes to take that, I didn't expect to ask the stumper of the morning. Really. I, I can take a little bit. Tony. Of so, uh, as Lauren mentioned, the, the, the thinking, I think this is reinforced by the sort of general thinking in the world of, uh, of cars and, and transportation in general, that they are moving inexorably at some speed toward an electric vehicle future. So that's certainly, when you're talking about moving from an internal combustion engine to an electric car, you're already talking about a dramatic reduction in energy consumption, and you're talking about the potential to move power with renewable energy or zero carbon energy. So from a, from a greenhouse gas point of view, that is an incredibly important. Uh, the other thing that when you're talking about, uh, about vehicle autonomy, and particularly when you're talking about it in the context of a shared vehicle system, is that you have opportunities to do things with vehicles that are right now not all that possible. So one thing that is possible is that you can match people's individual vehicle needs to the needs of an individual car. So it may be that you really, really want to have a five-person SUV for that trip that you take to the woods every year with your family when you go camping, but that for your daily commute, it's incredibly excessive. You don't really need all that space. You could get by with uh, either by sharing that space with others or by using a much smaller vehicle. 
And so there's opportunities in vehicle design and vehicle deployment that if you get the incentives right, and I think that's the key thing when we talk about pricing, when we talk about congestion pricing, uh, all of those things, if you get the incentives right, you have the opportunity to do some really creative things that give you the opportunity for some really transformative greenhouse gas benefits. Thank you, Tony. The gentleman right over there, his hand up. Yes. Hi, I'm Saul Tannenbaum. I'm a member of the City of Cambridge Transit Advisory Committee, who I'm not speaking for. Um, I'm going to direct this to Mayor Tradition as the public official on the panel. Um, not that I think he's responsible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm to say that I'm speaking for a <laughs> I'd like to talk directly about money because people are, um, you know, thinking about it, and the only, the only actual you know, direct mention of money was, the, you know, from the federal government's small grants about smart vehicles and smart cities, which is really pocket change compared to the, the amount of venture capital and R&D spending that's going on. Um, I mean, here in the metro region, we're, we're, you know, we have to fight for every single public transportation dollar. Um, and, I mean, as Mayor Crickertone knows, well, the Green Line extension is problematic. Um, um, because of that, how is the public sphere around driverless vehicles going to be funded? Um, why is this not going to just become another um, um, version of the car culture, um, you know, which trampled your city and, and mine, you know, with highways and parking lots? How do we actually fight against that, Mayor? How do we get more money for transportation? So. We'll have to have another panel discussion on that. Um, look, I don't know that answer. I will tell you that it is one that must be answered. Um, overall, uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, we don't, we're not as progressive, nearly progressive as we hold ourselves out to be, especially when it comes to funding public transportation. We don't do value capture. Uh, it's piecemeal, and uh, you know, I see friends from T for Mass here that tell you we're trying to be competitive in the 21st century global economy with mix and error infrastructure. When we're talking about autonomous vehicles and how we're going to do it. But we've got to find a way to do it. And I think to go back to another question when we talk about how you get the message out, this is not a technical challenge. This is really an adaptive challenge for one of the calls of the day. And how do we drive constructive disequilibrium around this conversation? And I think you do that by, why, by really stressing the data stresses what's at stake the sustainability of our environment, our public health, the lost of economic opportunity for our cities, for our regions, for our country. Uh, and what can be leveraged if we take on more progressive models of transportation and new technologies, and, and then we can have the discussion about how do you fund it. And I think if uh, the worst thing we can do as public policymakers is come on to say, ask money for something because it's going to meet a bureaucratic wall and it's not going to go anywhere. We see that right here in Massachusetts. We need to drive to the public this equilibrium on this issue. We need to turn it heat up, heat up on it. It's much more a value-based discussion in terms of our social uh, values as a society much more than an economic value conversation. And I would add to that as a public official as well. I think it's a very good question. Uh, you know, we have seen in this country and across the world many points in time when we needed a transformation of infrastructure. New energy systems, new transportation systems, a whole variety of, of changes. And it has yet to be seen whether or not driverless vehicles are going to necessitate a wholesale transformation of infrastructure, but they may. And we will need a way to pay for that. And we will need a question of not only whether or not and how the public pays for it, but whether there is any sharing in that expense between the public and the private infrastructure. And yet, as we try and make that deal between the public and private sectors, we can't do nothing. So I think it is a very, very significant question, as the mayor indicated uh, and the question, uh, one that we must address. We have time for, I think, two or three more. So folks, when I was in this classroom, <laughs> it was mostly men, and they asked most of the questions. I'd like that not to be the case today. Yes! Very good. Okay. Hi, I'm Jan Dever. I'm a Cambridge City Counselor. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I wanted to ask, I read that Norway had, is going to ban sales of new gas-fueled cars by 2025. Maybe that's
that's a Facebook myth. Uh, I believe it because I believe, and they seem to do everything really well in Scandinavia. We're talking about AVs. I feel like EVs have been sort of just like, can we assume that all these AVs will be electric and can we get our federal government to be bold and start requiring this kind of thing? Thank you, Councilor. Luke, Lauren? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that the technologies are being developed entirely separately. So even though I, literally every study that forecasts the impacts of driverless vehicles, everything I've seen uh, makes the assumption that they're electric vehicles, that is not necessarily the case. And again, I think that's a really important role for government is to make sure that that is the case. So, um, and that it's not just putting policies in place, it is gonna be making sure that the support infrastructure is there um, the charging stations, making sure that the charging stations are not proprietary to different types of vehicles. Um, and so, um, and, and the other kind of good news on this is that the technology is getting better very, very quickly. You know, the weight of the battery, the duration that it can last. So the potential is really there, but I think without the right incentives in place, um, people are going to continue to go for the cheapest option. So, and I, I think that cost is going to continue to go down so that they're more competitive. But that's a really important role for government. I'll add two things briefly. So um, that smart city challenge that I mentioned, the $40 million from the federal government was ultimately uh, added to or supported by additional $10 million from the Vulcan Foundation, specifically uh, focused on electrification. And there is a lot of coordination uh, going on between the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy because they're highly interested in this from an overall perspective to understand and to realize some of the benefits, but also they're concerned ultimately about the network of electric uh, support facilities in this country and whether it is capable of, of withstanding this additional use and need. So there is, uh, there is federal focus on this from multiple fronts. Thank you. Uh, so right there in the green, <clears throat> yes, my name is Steve Conter. I'm a citizen engineer from Cambridge. And my question is for John Cooper. We are both uh, MIT graduates in mechanical engineering. And last week, the MBTA... Who graduated first? That's what <laughs> First class of 65. Um, I took chemistry in this room. Um, last week, the MBTA announced the results of their total replacement of the fleet for the orange line. And they're going to increase the size of the fleet, increase the capacity of the cars, increase the capacity of the entire line by 35%. Now, driverless cars, we're basically talking about highway project. And in the urban area, that means congestion and bottlenecks. What's going to be the improvement in capacity in the air? Now, in your slides, one of your slides said there's going to be a decrease in VMT. In Lauren's slide, it said there's going to be an increase in VMT. And I think with the reduction in parking, the increase of empty cars traveling around, she's right. And if you can't reduce the VMT, why are you doing this? You're just going to have more congestion. And I would, in the remaining seconds of my time, just say we had a highway project 50 years ago. And there was a slide in the first presentation which showed this huge highway going through Central Square. It's called the Interbelt. The ring the seven radials cut highways coming in, all eight lanes, except for six lanes in the downtown central border. Guess where the bottleneck was? <laughs> Guess where it was? The traffic engineers in the late 50s said, you don't need six lanes, you need 24. And civil engineers said, build it just as we designed it with a six lane. Be careful here that you don't have another interbelt disaster. Thank you. And Jonathan, do you want to hand? <laughs> a lot, lot to answer there. Yeah. Um, so uh, I formerly lived, I live in Arlington now, but I formerly lived in the South End. I live right near the Southwest Corridor, in one of the areas that one of the intervals was supposed to go through. And it was fascinating to me when I moved in there to learn about the history of, of that and um, happily the fact that it didn't uh, materialize. Um, to clarify, in case it was interpreted or I, or I misspoke in any way, I, I in no way think BMT is, is going to go down. I 
don't know what BMT is going to do, almost all the estimates show that BMT is likely to go up. The numbers are staggering in terms of the variety of estimates that people provide. Some are between 70% BMT decrease to 250% BMT increase. So again, that crystal ball that I spoke of is very far from being clear as to as to what that will what will happen in that in that space. I'll just add, in terms of throughput, um, there is a lot of question of what this added BMT could mean because the vehicles could potentially travel much more closely together. Um, they could. Um, the, the, the roadways may not need to be as wide as they currently are, so you could potentially have added lanes in the same amount of roadway. So even with additional BMT, the level of congestion, it's, it's a bigger question of what that could mean for congestion. So, and that combined with the fact that if you had more shared fleets versus single occupancy vehicles, um, you know, even with increased BMT, um, if the I, or I shouldn't say the increased BMT, but with more people in the vehicles, you could potentially reduce the congestion. So there are quite a few different variables in play here, which makes it that much more difficult to forecast. We have time for one more question. I think we're going to give it to Jeff over here. Hi, my name is Jeff Rosenblum. I'm a co-founder of the Little Streets Alliance and now a student, PhD student here at MIT. I'm an engineer in the urban planning department. I don't know quite how that happened. Um, so the question I have is following on public transportation. So a little back of the end of the calculation that I'd like your, your feeling on. If we look at who takes public transportation, generally they're either people that can't afford to own a car, or people who can get there faster on rapid transit, or people who don't want to pay for parking at the tail end. So if we look at the number one bus, for example, in, in the Boston area, packed, fairly unpleasant in the morning, p.m. and the afternoon commute, a lot of middle class people riding it. Why? Not because they don't have a car, but generally because they, they can't afford, don't want to pay for parking at the tail end. If autonomous vehicles allow it, so people can own their car and have zero parking costs at the end because it just drops them off. If we look at the MBTA um, rider survey, the last one that was done, 30% of people who take buses, and I'm only talking buses, not rapid transit, 30% of people who take buses take buses because they don't, pay for, they don't want to pay for parking at the tail end. If we take 30% of the middle class people off our, our central bus system, we're sort of returning to the 1960s, where our bus system is purely just a thing that we have to do because poor people need to get around, so let's just put that thing out there. One of the benefits that we've had over the last 10 years is the more diverse people who ride public transportation, the more political support there is for public transportation, and the, more, the easier it is for government officials to support land use patterns that rely on, on public transportation. So I'm interested in your thoughts on on this shift of the middle class away from uh, public transportation. I'm going to start with the mayor on this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, a very political question, as, as it should be. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point, a, and a powerful point, and one, um, not directly, but sort of absorbing locally our own conversation about investment, mainline extension and investment, and now it's percolating up in terms of overall investment into the regional transportation system. Uh, where should that investment go? And I think it's something more, uh, I think we need to continue to measure and keep in mind as we adopt policies and move forward, we need to understand the implication. Certainly the benefits may be, you know, technology moving forward uh, are clear, but uh, we, we do not want to drive a certain ridership off public transportation. I think that's really important. Uh, and we certainly want to incentivize people that you, know, you can own two cars rather, rather than one or not. So I think if if we begin the conversation, as I mentioned earlier on, a certain set of values, social values, and then really think, I mean, the ability we have in, 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 in here locally, state, national, is to measure those impacts into the research. And I mentioned earlier, that's why we do the research. I think we keep that at the forefront and understand well, where ultimately we want to go as a society. And we certainly don't want any unintended consequences. It would not be one of the consequences we would like. I think we're going to close it out there. Thank you very much. <laughs> there are a couple of announcements very importantly. A few things before we, as we finish up. One is, uh, this afternoon we will be having an additional panel with many of these same panelists for local officials, particularly elected or appointed. Uh, I saw a number of people who raised their hand with, with questions. You can still comment at the MAPC office at 60 Temple Place. 
from 12 to 2 if you are an elected or appointed uh, local official. We are going to delve a little more deeply into the policy issues. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of two people who are here, one of whom uh, really started this work at MAPC and insisted to me that we need to be involved in dealing with driverless cars and dealing with the policy issues that flow from that. And that is Jess Robertson, who's here, who's since moved to the Where all she's doing is helping the city of Boston to develop a master plan for the first time in 50 years. But anyway, I was very sad to lose her and very glad to see her back in the audience today. And I'd also like to acknowledge Christina Egan, representing transform transportation and transformation. Why not? Transportation for Massachusetts, which is uh, the advocate for so many of us. I feel like they are our advocate and ABC's advocate uh, on state level issues regarding transportation. They are obviously a partner of ours in this work on innovative transportation funding, and we're very pleased to have Christina with us representing the So it's great to be here, and, and uh, hopefully I have, I have some, lots of little videos to show, little 10 second, second video clips if this works. Um, so let me, let me just tell you a little bit about what we're working on. We, um, we have a, a series of living lab partners around the city. We're working now in uh, Jerusalem, Taipei, Hamburg, etc. And in every case, we are uh, thinking about the implications of uh, autonomous vehicles on the city. Uh, there is, I think as... What's that? You still need to be rebooted that laptop. So this is this is the um, experience one finds in most cities. I, I shot this video clip out of the, the cab window in Beijing on a really good day. If you look at the sign there, it's all green and orange. There's no red. <laughs> This is, this is really the, the experience in, in most cities. Mobility is so criti critical to uh, rethink. Uh, old friend Robin Chase published this article about actually two years ago. Heaven or hell, the, the hell scenario uh, would be private autonomous vehicles in the city. Uh, the, the heaven scenario, shared use systems, I think she's, she's onto something. I think this is really critical. In fact, I think cities need to start thinking about banning private autonomous vehicles, at least banning private autonomous vehicles that are empty, because that would dramatically lead to uh, an increase in, in, in mileage. This was a, a study, MIT study in Singapore, looking at how a fleet of only 300,000 shared use so-called robo-taxis taxis could replace a fleet of 800,000 cars. Uh, 800,000 private cars meet the, the mobility needs of Singaporeans without public transit. It gets really interesting when you include mass transit and autonomous shared use vehicles. These are the modes that we think one needs in the city. And yeah, there are probably others. This one here is by far the most important on the upper left, which is walking. So we need to design for walking. Shared bikes, on demand shuttles increasingly replacing heavy infrastructure like light rail and subways. And then the vehicles in red are the ones that we've worked on in my group at the MIT Media Lab. And I, I just want to take for a minute you through our journey thinking about autonomous vehicles. This was the first vehicle that we did that got a lot of press and interest is the, the city car. <laughs> Drive-by-wire, robot wheels, folds, uses very little space, you know, three three of these for one parking space, but then we realized, we built a full-scale prototype, tested it in, in Spain, we realized that we weren't pushing that far enough. That really what, the, the city didn't need a better car. The city needed us to think about a whole new category of vehicles. 
and, I, and this something like this slide was shown earlier. I, I do think vehicles in the future will combine these three things, autonomy, vehicle sharing, and electric drive. So we took the city car and we thought, well, if, if it's in central cities and you have pedestrians walking in front of this vehicle, and there's no human to make eye contact with, the, the vehicle itself has to communicate its intention. Now this seemed like kind of a wacky idea, but then we had some of our sponsors, including Denso, the big auto supply company, that I met with in Tokyo last week, adopt this. So I think this is really critical in the future. Then we realized that we needed to push it a little farther. Vehicle sharing around that time was exploding. There's something over a thousand uh, bike sharing programs around the world right now. So we decided to do a lightweight electric vehicle. We call it a personal electric vehicle that could be integrated into a bike sharing program. It folded like the city cars that use very little space. Call it a persuasive electric vehicle to persuade you to shift to a more sustainable mode and to get more exercise. And then we then we realized that um, we had to think about moving goods too. This was kind of a silly scheme proposed by Amazon to fly packages with drones. So you'll never find thousands of these going around Boston. It's like you're a kid. Uh, Skype founders, a little robotic well, device to deliver packages. So we thought, well, let's, let's design a people moving, shared use, lightweight electric autonomous system that can meet demand at peak hour and then off peak move goods autonomously. So that's what we started to work on. Back in December, we tested this on the campus. Didn't even get any second bucks. This is kind of a, <laughs> kind of a, a normal day. Now, the idea here is, is that it's, it's like a driverless Uber system in that you call for pickup. It comes to you wherever you are. It operates at slow speed. <laughs> and that was not canned. Um, we don't care about autonomy when people are on it in this case. Uh, we think people should get exercise. The, the value of it is come to you wherever you are, you get off wherever you end up, and it goes on its way. We launched this at the Consumer Electronics Show. This is our latest version of it. There was an article written that the message here is that autonomous vehicles are not scary. In fact, they're quite practical and can even help the planet. This is what we were going for, actually, because CES had a bunch of uh, high-performance, sort of aggressive, masculine, high-speed high vehicles filled with sensors. We, we designed something a little bit like a baby buggy. And uh, we, we wanted it to purposely be, be very gentle. So this is legal in bike lanes, not cars. Legal, um, it's bike-like, not car-like. Operates walking to bicycle speed, very low-cost autonomy. We think we can get this down to about $500. Shared use for those people and goods. I uh, led the mobility keynote panel at CES, and it, uh, Secretary um, Anthony Fox on the panel, CEOs of Mobileye, Bosch, Qualcomm. Does everybody know Mobileye? Yeah, they do the technology the, you know, that the Tesla uses for autopilot. It's very interesting. I showed this to Anthony Fox. I had a chance to hang out with him. I said, one reason we're doing this is we don't have to comply with your regulations. And I said, fantastic, go for it. <laughs> Uh, just a little bit, what we're doing in Kendall Square, we have a, we, we, we like to model the city using what we call the city scope. Uh, and uh, this is Kendall Square. In yellow is where all the housing is. And I think you can't separate a discussion about mobility from housing. I think the two have to go hand in hand. And where young people are active, this is uh, geolocated tweets, which is kind of a proxy for where young people are active. And, uh, if you, if you, <coughs> you working? Yeah. You look here. Third Street is where all the uh, restaurants are. It's very active. That dead building there, sorry, is the Bulky Center. <laughs> <laughs> Media Lab is very bright. And, but if you look at if you look at tweets on the weekends, this is completely dead. At night is completely dead. Kendall Square is kind of a dysfunctional place with respect to livability. So we, we looked at uh, Kendall Square. We, we, we did a quick model of, of transportation. If you look on the lower right, right uh, vehicle parking user time, you will see the movement of uh, vehicles uh, when, they're, when they're private. 
number of vehicles parking time, that you have some great advantage when you move the shared use vehicles. And every little white box there is a parking lot, which is shown in red, which can be freed up for other uses. But if you move to shared autonomous vehicles, then you can provide mobility with a fraction of the number of vehicles, uh, a third of the vehicles, very little parking. And I think the total trip time is, is maybe cut in half because no one needs to look for parking. Now, this, this is a quick approximate approximation, but I think you get the point. If you take a parking lot in Kendall Square, we pick one with 45 cars, and you replace that with micro units at the legal height allowed in Cambridge, you can, you can then replace 45 cars with 528 people. That's enabled by essentially getting rid of parking by moving to shared use. We are, we're also working on uh, a new model for housing. Very small micro units, in this case 200 square feet, that operates, I think, as is three times, if it's three times larger. This is all about bringing density and vibrancy and equity into the city. If you can provide housing right in Kendall Square so people can live and work, and by the way, the Cambridge Innovation Center, essentially everybody surveyed there would love to live right next door and walk to work. So I think this is much more important than autonomous vehicles in terms of reducing energy, increasing sustainability, increasing vibrancy and the like. We're looking at now modeling the city. The little blue dots are millennials in the key part of this city. We kind of mocked up uh, a section of Barcelona. And you move micro units down and you can see how mid-career and senior people and young professionals can all interact and we can then model this impact on mobility to start with and then model the impact on mobility of the shared use likely personal electric vehicles. Uh, very quickly what we're doing in Andorra, this is an, uh, a little country between Spain and France with 85,000 people. Eight million visitors a year, they all drive in. We have all of the uh, telecom CDR data and Wi-Fi data for the entire country. And here you can see a traffic jam. <laughs> when you enter at the French border, the Cirque du Soleil, we can model the movement of, of uh, people or vehicles because everybody drives there. And we're using that information to then help us design a little PEV deployment pilot test in the capital. What we're looking at now is about a two kilometer street, uh, not mixing with cars, where we will have these little electric vehicles pick up packages and pick up people, drop off people, drop off packages, and we're now modeling the impact on the city and seeing what kind of reduction we can get in traffic and um, parking and the like. And then the last thing I'll just show very quickly, Jerusalem. I was just there doing a workshop to look at the implications of autonomous vehicles in Jerusalem. It's landlocked, basically, politically infeasible to expand the city very much. Series of villages on the hill type top. They were conceived in, by, in a, a 1944 master plan as being places of living and working and playing well integrated. <coughs> because of the cars, they basically are bedroom communities. We're now looking at having three modes in the neighborhood walking, very lightweight personal electric vehicles, and autonomous, dynamically routed shuttles that can then be platooned on the highway. And we just uh, did some quick Photoshop hacks in this workshop where this is a typical streetscape. You see what would change if you move to autonomous shared vehicles. So you get rid of parallel parkings, make the, uh, the pathway is much narrower, get rid of curbs, get rid of parking lots. Uh, you add the little PEVs and the shuttles, you can expand uh, the, the build area, increasing the cafes and, and uh, grocery stores and pharmacies and all the other amenities. Uh, increase the density significantly without because you don't have problems with traffic and parking add housing, et cetera, it's pretty interesting. So we're now developing a project in Jerusalem to a little more systematically look at the implications of this. And then finally, I'll leave you with this. I, I put my camera on a garbage can in, in Amsterdam. And you know, I think this is the future. You find cities like Amsterdam banning private cars. Uh, 
this is shared space. In, in this video, you see mass transit, you see the trams, you see cars moving very slowly. Lots of people, lots of bicycles. Uh, and I think if, if you go one step farther and remove private vehicles and replace them with very lightweight bike-like autonomous vehicles and shuttles and other modes, I think you get to something very powerful. So even though, you know, this is MIT and center of the universe of technology, I think in, in all cases we need to start by designing for people, thinking about vibrancy, et cetera, think about quality of place, and then add technology when it's useful. Thank you.